Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, City Commission Conference meeting this uh, 17th day of April 19, uh, 2022. Uh, thank you all for being here today. We have a, a number of uh, important dis issues to discuss this afternoon, and, uh, um, and I appreciate all of you being here. So um, let us uh, begin by um, taking roll. Do we take roll? Well, let's just take roll. Commissioner Moretis? Here. Commissioner Glassman? Here. Commissioner McKenzie? Not present at the moment. Vice Mayor Sorensen? Here. Mayor Trentiles? Here. Uh, let us begin with the communications. There was one communication from the cemetery board. I, I questioned Mr. Thornburg what this was all about. Phil, are you, uh, do you want to respond to the rest of the commission as to what this was about? Is there really any action that we're supposed to take? Good afternoon, Mayor. Um, no, there's no action. The cemetery board just wanted to make the commission aware that they thought that there was a need for some additional staff at the cemetery. We've had some discussions with them. Uh, it'll be part of the discussion we have with the city managers to go through the budget process. So we'll just have to see how it kind of flushes out during the process. But it is something that they felt passionate about and wanted to make sure the commission was aware as well. Okay. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Thornburg? All right, there being none, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> moving on, we have, uh, we begin with our conference reports, uh, CF1 medical director report from fire rescue. Chief, are you here to report? We have two people who have signed up to speak after you're finished speaking. Can we do our report first? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. So uh, first of all, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, and uh, a little over a year ago, actually March, we uh, executed a contract with new uh, doctor for our medical director services, and at that time we were asked to provide an annual report. And so we are here today to give you that just a brief summary, and we did also provide you with a document as well. And um, I'm going to have my assistant chief, uh, Stephen Shaw, he's going to do the report. And uh, Dr. Roach is here if you should have any questions. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good afternoon. So, Mayor, Commissioners, I'm proud to present a brief synopsis of the report I provided you earlier. Since this 300 page report? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Only eight. <laughs> I'm um, happy to report that since Dr. Roach has taken over as medical director, uh, we have a new set of EMS protocols that are available on our new EMS protocol website, the FL, FL, <laughs> FLFR, emsprotocols.org. We are currently in our fifth iteration of this uh, medical protocol. They are interactive and up-to-date, and going forward, we will regularly maintain them with the latest science and the data. Dr. Roach has familiarized himself and has been very interactive with our organization. Tuesdays are dedicated to Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. Tuesdays, Dr. Roach spends pretty much the whole day with us, whether it's at a CQI meeting, health and safety, or visiting firehouses. He's trained with multiple bureaus and the specialty teams, including our SWAT team, the Training and Special Operations Bureau, the Marine Fire Boat, and he's attended multiple special events, including the Fort Lauderdale Air Show, along with Tortuga Music Festival. He attends every CQI meeting and most health and safety meetings, and he's available 24-7 to answer any questions, so if we have them. He responds to incidents with the members of our EMS Bureau when, the, when he's available. We recently went through the CAS accreditation process, which is the Commission on Accreditation for Ambulance Services, on April 29th and 30th of 2021, and we received our accreditation status. Also, the CAS accreditation team was very impressed by the ideas that Dr. Roach was bringing in terms of CQI, Continuous Quality Improvement. Since the inception of him as our new medical director, we've been, uh, incorporated new equipment and training into our organization, including new HEPA filtered aerosol masks that during COVID allowed us to treat with our normal aerosolized medications that we couldn't do prior to COVID starting with the traditional mask we have. We have new airway adjuncts, new medications, including fentanyl and ketamine. We have updated our pediatric in-house training course to, uh, to meet the needs of our, our department-specific uh, training. Uh, in the summertime coming up, Dr. Roach is going to be scheduling some quick clot and some SWAT training with our SWAT and SWAT medics. And right now, we have 24 medics in the sign-up process and 15 that started yesterday, which he has an intimate relationship with. And just as a reminder, each of our paramedics that goes through our paramedic sign-off process is, is, it basically goes through and assesses each one of them individually, one-on-one -on -one before they release the standalone medics. It's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, interaction there. Some current and future initiatives. 
Uh, right now, or during COVID, he approved the use for COVID vaccines, and then we weren't able to get a lot of them, we were started deploying our COVID vaccines to our vulnerable population. We continue to maintain our, our strong relationships with our, our department and, and Broward Health. Uh, this led to the development of a collaborative protocol that helped our medical rescue units return to service quickly when the wait times at the hospitals became problematic. He supported delivering Regeneron, the monoclonal antibodies in the field, though we didn't get a chance to do those either. He was supportive and signed off the paperwork to do those. And currently, he's intimately involved with our mobile integrated healthcare program and how we can further develop that. He attended our mobile integrated healthcare community needs assessment on the 12th of this month and was very informative and supportive of that. Last year in May, he took on Dr. John Cunha from, uh, Cunha from Holy Cross as our associate medical director. He serves as a liaison at Holy Cross. Dr. Cunha also was awarded the 2021 Broward County EMS Physician Award from the Fire Chiefs Association of Broward County. And as a last final note, I wanted to make sure I, I gave a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Roach. Uh, during last year, I believe it was in March, one of our firefighters was uh, experiencing a, a near-death medical emergency uh, as that firefighter was being transferred from a plane and uh, met over at the, the Fort Lauderdale uh, Airport. Dr. Roach was one of the first people there and was the first person to have hands on our firefighter as they took him off the plane to transfer him to an ambulance to give him the care that he needed. So from Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue, Dr. Roach, thank you very much. Uh, that is a synopsis of what we've been through in the last year and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, great, thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I do, thanks. No, go ahead, Commissioner. Let's begin, uh, <clears throat> do you have any questions? Okay, okay, no questions. All right, Commissioner um, Glassman. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks so much for the report. What, what I would ask, though, in, in the future, um, it's tough, like, we got a new report, an updated report last night, I, and I just didn't have time to compare the one that was in the backup to the one that was new. So I would just say in the future, and maybe even Greg, if we're going to get updated information the night before a commission meeting, it would be really helpful if the updated report just highlighted what's new so that I don't have to go back and read the original seven page report that I had and then compare it to the new report I got last night and see what was missing or what I needed to be updated on. It, would just, it makes it easier for us because there's a lot to read and that would just be easier. But um, that being said, thank you. I had a couple of points I just wanted to ask about just to make sure from my own knowledge because a lot of this is something I'm playing catch up on. But I do remember the conversation we had last year when we switched medical directors. And um, what I was actually looking for in this report, because those were my concerns, I know that we were being told that we had to take it to the next level and that we were going to look for innovative initiatives and technologies. So going through the report and help me understand this, I just want to make sure that I have this right. So I'm looking on page four and five. Uh, actually, that was the old report. Um, but the CAS accreditation, just let me know. We had that before, right? We've always had that accreditation. That's nothing new, is it? We have been re-accredited, yes, sir. We had it previously, and we are re-accredited now, yes, sir. Okay, so we that's nothing new. I just wanted to make sure. And then also, with regards to the Narcan, that's something that I believe we always had before as well, right? That that policy for the use of Narcan? We've... We've always uh, assisted PD with their administration of Narcan in the field. We track that. We meet regularly with them, and that relationship continues to go strong. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, on pages six and seven, where it does talk about initiatives, um, the report refers to the ET3 um, as emergency treatment, triage, and transport. But shouldn't it be emergency triage, then treatment and transport? I'm confused on that one. I thought that's what that meant, emergency treatment. I'm sorry, emergency triage, then treatment, then transport. But this keeps referring to emergency treatment, then triage and transport. Are those words mixed up in this? They might be. I can verify that for you. But in the, the program itself, we're looking into to see if it could be uh, deployed here in Fort Lauderdale, which gives us the advantage of not having to transport patients to the hospital. Um, Telemedicine is involved with this. And we're trying to see if this program plays a, po a role in our, our protocols. Okay, I would just check though, because I think that that's what it, I, I think it should be reading emergency triage, then treatment, then transport, as yes, opposed to the way it's written um, in the report. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to make sure, because what you just said concerns me just a little bit on, on that initiative, um, because I get nervous if people are going to be asked in an emergency situation about their insurance. So, I mean, because obviously the bottom line should be the treatment that happens and not worrying about um, 
before they're transferred somewhere. In other words, they, I don't want to see that ever impact the, the level of care for people. So uh, are we in danger of, of having something like that happen? Absolutely not, sir. Our primary focus is the care of our residents, the citizens, the people that, that uh, travel to Fort Lauderdale. This program uh, is part of a larger involving program with mobile integrated health care. Long story short, not everybody needs a ride to the hospital. That being said, those that don't need a ride to the hospital, we're trying to figure out what best resources to meet for those individuals, whether it's a non-emergent transport to a healthcare clinic or what have you. Our goal is still, no matter what, the, the proper treatment, the right time, the right place with the right person. Right, but isn't the ET3, um, isn't that for Medicare and Medicaid pass, um, patients? Uh, Commissioner, let me clarify maybe just a little bit. That is a federally funded program, and it's a pass-through, but it is allows payment to us, the, tre the tra treating and transporting agency, to take people to non-emergency room um, sites. So in other words, we may be able to take somebody to a sobriety center, or we may be able to take somebody to an assisted living facility where where they really need to be as opposed to an emergency room. Well, they may sit there in the emergency room because it's really not a true, you know, a life-threatening emergency. And they may sit there for hours and hours and hours. So it's a program that is federally funded and it started to get off the ground and then it kind of lagged behind once pandemic came along. But we are, um, it's, and it was very intensive in regard to how you applied for it. So, but we are still looking towards putting that into our protocols. Okay. So the care won't be affected by a person's insurance? And Absolutely, no. Okay, good. Absolutely and then not. All it does is allow us to, like you said, triage and treat and then transport to the appropriate facility, which isn't always the emergency room. Okay, good. Um, when we're doing something like that, though, again, another concern, um, if they're taken to what I guess people would consider a lower level of care, is there any liability there for the city? Is there any problem? No, and that's why the that whole ET3 program is um, so intensive and takes a great deal of um, uh, application. And so I think in most cases you need to have a nurse or a nurse practitioner on staff or that is working with you with that program. That's why it's a collaborative program. And, and I don't know if maybe Dr. Roach knows even more about it, um, but we would certainly be glad to provide you more information. Okay, thank you. And then lastly, um, with regards to the community paramedicine, um, I mean, it does, it sounds terrific. Is that an initiative that would be budget neutral or will that involve more costs or how does that work out? It's, it's one of those things right now we're investigating it very, very deeply. Um, last week we had our first community needs assessment and at present at that meeting was the state representative for community paramedicine at the state level. He came down and we, after the meeting, after the needs assessment, we sat and talked with him for upwards of three hours to determine kind of where we could uh, further advance this program. It's still very new in the inception and we're trying to figure out kind of where to go. Um, everybody that is incorporated, every fire rescue agency that incorporates some sort of program like this has done it based on their specific needs. The quickest way to fail in this, in, in this kind of program is to just copy the one that somebody else has done. So for us, we're doing a lot of research to figure out what this means for our agency, kind of the best deploy that. And, and, you know, in the question that you asked about, will it be, is it cost neutral? Um, it is not cost neutral. There is a, an, an expense to that because we're looking at a different way that we're t taking care of the community. And so that may be, you know, it's additional personnel that are working in that, you know, community paramedicine program. But it it does in some ways have probably a bit of an offset because what we try to do is, for example, we've been working with one gentleman uh, and we've been using some of our current staff. And so he called uh, 911 22 times in I think three months. And by taking care of him and getting him the right treatment and the right facility and getting him the care that he needed, we're no longer responding 22 times to that individual. So there is, you know, a cost offset, but there's also a cost to providing that kind of service. Great. No, understood. Thank you. And I appreciate everything you folks do every single day. So thank you for that service. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yeah. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Chief. 
Um, thanks, Chief Shaw and, and Dr. Roche. So, Chief Kerr, a couple questions. One, when we were talking about um, this last year, one of the concerns that was raised was, hey, um, Dr. Roach is not at Broward Health Medical. Will that relationship suffer as a result? And I think we then felt like, you know what, we don't think it will suffer. Now, a year later, how are we doing on that relationship? The relationship is probably stronger than ever. Okay. Um, we just had, as he, as Chief Shaw explained, we had a, uh, a our first stakeholders meeting, and all of the hospitals were involved in that meeting. And I talked to um, our CEO from Broward Health, and she was talking about how great Dr. Roche has been, and how they've been working together, and how we're all right. working together. So nothing has suffered. It's probably stronger than ever. Okay, that's great. Um, excellent. The uh, the other concern I remember one of the I think maybe the only other concern I had with Dr. Roche starting was just he's does great work around the community with BS all kinds of um, organizations and supporting. I think I I asked him uh, was hey given all you're doing are you gonna have time for us you know in the city of Fort Lauderdale? It sounds like that's a resounding yes, but I just want to get your feedback on it. So that is absolutely a resounding yes, and as Chief Shaw stated. Every Tuesday, Dr. Roach spends the entire day, or maybe part of the night, depending, with uh, Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue. So we really are getting more individual attention than we were before. Okay, great. Um, then I just I wanted to just ask Dr. Roach a, a question or two, if that's all right. So, hey, Dr. Hey, Commissioner, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your your service and your work. Um, so a couple questions. One is, uh, most importantly, what happened to the firefighter who was your hands-on? That was... Back to work. Yeah, he's back to work. Um, uh, the details of that, he, he got sick in New Jersey. Okay. By plane, we flew him into the airport and picked him up. And we actually took him to Broward Health. He okay. made a full recovery, and uh, he's been doing great. As a matter great. of fact, he volunteered to go to Ukraine to support the mission. Oh, this was Johnny, or what was... Maddie Johnson. Maddie Johnson, yeah. Maddie, yeah, okay. Awesome. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes, it's a firefighter. Um, great. Um, so next question is, how are how are you feeling? How is this going? It sounds like you're covering out plenty of time. It seems like the Chiefs are very happy. How are you feeling? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, it's an honor. Like I said a year ago when I came here, to, to be a part of the fire service is, is an honor for me. This is uh, a labor of love. And uh, it's to work with Chief Kerr and Chief Shaw. These are they're exceptional people. And the things that they're doing really are, it's not just about the, you know, fire rescue and the typical you know, um, service lines that you think of, but they're really out of the box thinkers, which motivates me and to do other things. We talked about ET3, we talked about mobile security healthcare, we talked about care at home. We, we wanna um, work with Broward Health to help, for example, decrease readmissions through mobile integrated healthcare, help them with their ER discharges. I mean, really everything. Um, then just being out on the cruise, riding with them. Um, every time I go out with them, I learn something personally yeah. about uh, re-hospital medicine, about how to make their jobs. The mantra that I have is, how do I make your jobs easier? And, and then also at the same time, improve the outcomes for our community. For the citizens of, of, of Fort Lauderdale, how do we make things better for them? And the only way to do that is to be out on the trucks and see how they're doing things. And I think with the protocols, the equipment, I think we've done that. And I, and I constantly get feedback from, from all of them. What can I do to help you? How can I make your jobs better? And so for me, it's just been an honor and I continue to learn and, and uh, appreciate everything, so. Great, what can we be doing better? Like when you think about just supporting you or organizationally? Well, you know, I think that when, you know, the fire chief has the, the answers for those things, and okay. I think just supporting her vision, okay. and that's what I do, support her vision. Um, ET3 is a big thing. See, what, where things are going in the next five to ten years, it's just like maybe 30 years ago, chief, when, when they were fighting fires and ambulance wasn't as big a part of it. Now the EMS is the biggest part of the, of the fire rescue service. Ten years from now, possibly, you'll be talking about ET3 or transporting to destinations other than the emergency department, um, taking care of people at home, partnering with the hospitals. So there's all kinds of things and we have to stay nimble. We have to stay in front, in front of these things. 
so those are the you know those are the opportunities really um okay yeah great thank you thank you for what you're doing doctor appreciate it. my next question is for chief and maybe greg so again just because i'm still understanding this role so does the medical director is that the, does the medical director solely serve fire rescue does the medical director serve pd at all so i want to i want to leave that to um Fire chief to answer. Sure. So I'm I'm I, I'm going to let um, the doctor answer that, but um, I know that he provides medical direction for some of PD. Okay, so I mean, just start, but before, so great, I'd love to hear from him, but but chief and great, I just want to understand contractually, is that permissible or is this allowed or is this part? I, I just want some clarity on that. Um, understand that. You know, I don't contractually, think... contractually, it's permissible, I believe, and, and the doctor can correct me, but yeah. there's a SWAT component with PD that also receives some training and support from the medical director, and that would be encompassed within the contract. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's part of the contract. Okay. So go ahead. We have specialty units. So SWAT medics, for example, they're going to be specifically trained how to handle traumatic injuries, gunshot wounds, yeah. that those types of things. So there's special training with that, with tourniquets and that clotting agents, those types of things. And then with Narcan was brought up, for example, that's one of the things. So when we looked at the Narcan, you know, the police, we had to kind of tweak their their um, process there. They were given a little too much Narcan. So we had to write a policy to limit it to two doses of the Narcan. So that's how we just interact with the police, make sure that the Narcan they're giving was appropriate and the outcomes were appropriate. It's just yeah. oversight over the things because they are actually using medicines and right. police. So. Okay, great. The, thank you, doctor. Thanks, Chief. That's that's perfect. Um, my, Mayor, that was, that was it. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, there are a couple of people who signed up to speak. So um, thank you for your testimony today. And also, Dr. Roach, thank you for all the work that you do on behalf of our community. We really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> two people signed up to speak, uh, Bill Brown, followed by Jacqueline Scott. <clears throat> I guess Jacqueline Scott, followed by Bill Brown. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. I love the fire department. I love the police department. You guys do a great job, and I appreciate you tremendously. Back in 1997 was the year, or 96, when the city commission decided that working with the county no longer worked because response times were horrible, um, and we needed to have a system to be able to protect our residents. So they took the plunge, took the leap, and we started our own EMS. And it was the right thing to do. And I, I suspect that the number one reason that we did that as a city was because of response times. Because if you don't get there fast enough, you're not gonna save a life when it comes to cardiac arrest and other emergencies. So the reason I'm bringing this up is I think we're now at another pivotal stage within Fort Lauderdale and the county, where well, we are dependent on the county for um, dispatch. And I don't think, I, I think it's horrible, quite frankly. Um, no matter how good of a paramedic you have, no matter how good of a police officer you have, if the information is not given quickly, accurately, they can't save lives. So, and let me, so, so let me respond to that because you know this issue came up several years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember um, Lee Feldman was our city manager at the time. So his analysis, which we could update, his analysis was that it would cost the city, was it $4 million, $5 million? It was a lot of millions, okay? And on top of that, the- oh, I'm sorry, it would cost the city- that much to do what? Every year to establish our own okay. uh, 911 dispatch, okay? In addition, the county went ahead and raised their millage rate so that everyone pays into it to, to subsidize the cost of their 911 dispatch operation. So if we did our own, we would be double paying. So, um, but I have no objection to another analysis Greg, if, if the city manager's office wants to undertake another analysis as to what it would actually cost, because maybe things have changed, maybe we can find a different approach to responding, but you are absolutely correct. We've had nothing but, I mean, I don't hear the problems anymore. Maybe they've gotten better. I, I, think, I think people have given up because of what you just said. And why would any business or any city spend millions of dollars 
for the citizens to have this great system, but the system is broken because of that dispatch, well, at least. Well, part and of it is because of lack of uh, available personnel. I agree. Keep that in mind. I agree. There I don't think enough people willing to do the job. I, I, I'm passionate about this because I, you probably know, Dean, I was an emergency room nurse for years. I was around before there was even paramedics in the field. So I really want us to be able to provide the right care and the right response times for our citizens. Okay. And Bill is now going to tell you about an incident that he and I had together last week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor, that brings up a point. And maybe uh, Chief, is the Chief still here? Oh, yes. Because um, it came up at my pre-agenda <laughs> meeting last evening. Thank you. Um, the response times and what we were doing, was there a strategy? Because some neighborhoods are very concerned, and rightfully so, uh, about response times and what they are, and they're just uncomfortable with it. Do we have a strategy? Do we have a plan to deal with response times around the city? So um, there's some things that we do not have control over. And the things that we don't have control over are the time that it takes the dispatcher for the 911 system to process the calls. We have control over how quickly we get to the fire trucks, and that's about it. Because once we leave you know, the station or once we go en route, then we're in traffic. So we don't have a whole lot of control over response times. And as you know, you know sometimes traffic is gridlock anywhere like and you live up there on, you know, off of A1A and the traffic is stopped in both directions and there's only one lane and there is a median in the middle. So that delays response times as well. So there isn't a whole lot that we can do about that other than, again, like you said, is um, adding stations, you know, to accommodate and adding additional units because sometimes units are tied up and then there is no available unit to go to the emergency, so then they have to come from out of district or out of zone. So there are things that can be done, and you know that involves, of course, uh, more additional units and additional personnel. And then, again, the county dispatch system we do not have control over. Is a map of the city and response times um, looked at uh, on a routine basis just to see how we're doing in comparison to what we were before? And so that is looked at uh, continually? Yes, all the time. And we use a mapping system uh, that, that we use for an analysis program. And it helps us to determine where we deploy units. And then some cases we even put, like that's when we move the four units that we have that have a third person. That's sometimes we move that around as well so that, um, you know, with the third person on a unit, then it leaves the engine company available to run secondary simultaneous calls. So we are constantly looking at that and constantly looking at where we move units or who we send on those responses. And then we look at, you know, railroads and, uh, you know, barricades that would re, re, like would hinder the response time, I guess is what I'd like to say. So that's why like we don't always send all units from the same station to an emergency because one comes from one west side of the tracks and maybe one comes from the east side of the tracks. So we are constantly looking at what we can do to improve response time. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a couple questions. If that's right. Of of uh, Jackie. Of, of uh, Chief. Sorry. Oh, okay. Chief. Just connected to that before Can Bill. Can you come back, or, please? Or Bill sorry. That's all right. Bill's much more interesting character to talk to than me, so I don't blame you, distinguished young man. Uh, um, do is there a way to have an analysis of the time from when a call is received at the regional center to when it's transitioned to us? So there, yes, there is, and that has to come from the county. That data has to come from the county, and I, without getting too elaborate, yeah. we are uh, currently preparing a report for the city manager, uh, asking for a report data warehouse that will reside strictly in the city of. Fort Lauderdale, and that will give us and the police department access to all the CAD data that we can do our own analysis on all those yeah. type of things. Because right now it's difficult sometimes to get that from the county and they are now uh, limiting our access to that data. 
So we are, uh, like I said, preparing a report to ask the city manager to allow us to do an emergency purchase for two things that will help us in regard to uh, how we respond and uh, how we do our reports and the information that we get from those reports being available. Okay, great, because to me, that's the linchpin. If that time, the average time is longer than, than it should be or that's the problem, if, if not, then th I think, yeah, that, that, that's what matters the most, I think. Is yes, that fair? That's the biggest data and, point. And I do hear that um, people say that they call 911 and nobody answers. Right, and I've heard that too. And they call. Nobody, right, and they hang up again, and and then when that's brought to the attention, they just say, "Well, we're ninety people short," but that's mm. you know that's not okay when people yeah, have an. It doesn't work. So, the, we great. Worry about yeah, that, that staffing. But we is don't concerned. have all that data. Okay. You know, but we will if we had our own data warehouse. The other or, or another reason why I think you can make a strong argument for we should have our own system if we analyze all this data and so forth is that. Hey, if a um, a city has their own um, <clears throat> call center functionality, that it's going to be people that are familiar solely with Fort Lauderdale, and that's their focus. And so, when you try to convey addresses or locations, that might be difficult. If it's just exclusively a city team, there's less likelihood of ambiguity and so forth. Um, that I think, and I don't know how you quantify or how you kind of evaluate that, but is, is that another kind of area to try to look at? Yeah, it is. So there are many different variations of how you can run a PSAP or a public safety answering point, which is the communication center. And uh, and I've experienced a number of different ones. So, uh, for example, like if you had like in Austin, Texas, we had uh, firefighters were the dispatchers. So they were trained firefighters and and then they their selection of where they were going to be um, bid and where they were going to be based was in the comm center, and they were the dispatchers. So they absolutely can give, obviously, better information right. and data. And the same thing was with in Austin, and we were just a fire-based system. We were not an EMS system as well, but paramedics also staffed the communication center. So information could be given to the caller while they're waiting for you know the unit to arrive. Or give information, like for example, somebody called and said, "Hey, there's smoke coming, you know, down from the light above right. in the ceiling. Yeah. I'm going to push the the um, tile up and look." And the firefighter says, "No, don't do that because if there was a fire up there, adding the oxygen would just make the fire get larger." So you know, there are advantages to different types of systems. And then obviously, if your firefighters are staffing a communication system then they don't you don't have a problem with staffing you know you hire people that are firefighters to yep. do that you know it's a very difficult in a, a civilian communication system is very difficult to maintain staffing it's a a nationwide problem it's not just here okay all right thanks chief thanks mayor thank you <clears throat> mr brown <clears throat> good afternoon mayor Vice Mayor, members of the commission, Bill Brown, resident of Fort Lauderdale Beach for many years. And for disclaimer, I am a retired firefighter, but I'm not being biased in this report. Uh, I had skepticism, as you did, Commissioner, a year ago about the politics of all this. But I'm happy to report, and having talked to several firefighters the past year, they're much happier. And when the firefighters are happy, firefighters are, are your most valuable asset to any department. It's just like police officers are. They're a very, it's, yes, it's a costly asset, but yeah, it's an important one. If the firefighters are happy, they're performing well, they're following safety procedures, their health, welfare, and their stress levels are down. So I'm pleased to report that um, I think it's working well with the new medical director. I'm glad to hear they reviewed all the protocols because protocols are very important uh, to get boots on the ground to patient care when they immediately uh, arrive. And Commissioner Glassman, you brought up the cost about uh, the mobile integrated health and how, what's those costs? Well, yes, as the chief said, there are going to be costs, but you have to also look at what's the cost benefit in the savings long term when you have examples of people abusing the system, calling them 70 times, 40 times, and they have to respond. So I think it, with the right approach to this program that they're doing with stakeholder involvement, it can work, but there's going to be some costs involved. And then uh, just briefly, I'd like to touch on the, the problems with dispatch. Uh, I had, as Ms. Scott mentioned, we had an incident 
uh, back in February after we left City Hall, came upon an accident within seconds after it happening, called 911, got the dispatcher. It was a very critical incident, uh, partial leg amputation. Uh, the, his leg was broken tib fib, it was only hanging by the, the calf of the skin. So I told the dispatcher, this is a, a level one trauma incident, partial leg amputation, where we need a tourniquet immediately. We weren't able to, I didn't have a belt, and we were trying to find a tourniquet. Fortunately, there was a doctor's office across the street. We were able to get a blood pressure cup, cuff and put on to control the bleeding. I said, make sure the responding units know this, and I repeated it a second time. That information did not get passed down to the responding units. That's unacceptable, you know, because situational awareness is very critical in patient care or responding to people trapped in a fire. And they did investigate fire department. The crews did an excellent job. Well, the problem lied with dispatch because they did take the information, but they passed it to the police side and never passed it over to the fire side. Yes, there's uh, 80, 90 people short. By the time they train up them, and you're gonna be, a, you know, you gotta plan on 110, so they have to start pre-planning. And I think this is why I've mentioned to this commission before, and I encourage you that we, we seriously take a look at a fire EMS advisory board to help guide the fire department in all these programs and support them in these programs and these initiatives and dispatch issues. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, so picking up on what you folks have been saying, do we want to direct the city manager's office to engage in another analysis of what it would cost if we <clears throat> um, had our own 911 dispatch? I think, is that this? I think it makes sense. Think? I'm just trying to get my bearings together. I, I thought we had this discussion even before. But, but about after, five years ago we had it. Even after. I don't. Because I brought it up once again, and I think there's some numbers out there. Uh, I know the chief was out of the room when this happened. Chief, why do you keep sitting no, down? No, chief. <laughs> police chief. She gets her steps in this way. Police chief. Um, you stepped out of the room. We, we were talking. Can you come up to the mic for a minute? Just wanna... <clears throat> and you may or may not have the information, but what we were talking about is the advantages and disadvantages of bringing the um, 911 call system back to our own operations. Um, advantage, disadvantage, and what would you think the cost would be? And maybe you don't have that information right now, but could you talk a little bit about that since you, you have experienced it at all the agencies you've worked with? Um, and the other question I would like to know, how many other cities run their own 911 systems in, in Broward County? Okay. If you can answer that. Yes. Is the microphone on? Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's only two other cities that have their own uh, PSEPs, as they call it, Plantation and Coral Springs. Uh, going back to our own would be a significant uh, undertaking in staffing and cost, and keeping those facilities staffed regularly is an ongoing problem. Uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, if you'd like, we can prepare a, a list of something for you, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big undertaking, and you, I'm sure you would understand that there's also the political ramifications of that, too. We just what, within the last six years or so, merged everything with the county uh, under the <clears throat> county system. So it's a it's a large undertaking. And, and, and if you could provide the numbers, it would be great for us, I think, preliminary. Uh, but also, um, what are your <clears throat> experiences um, with calls? I mean, I've, I got some um, scenarios I could share with the audience where um, there was difficulty um, when they made the call, but once um, that call was dispatched to us, we were responding in a reasonable time to the calls, both on fire and, and police side, uh, after we investigated. And these are some of the things that we threw around that day in, in the room. So um, what is your experiences? I know the, uh, the fire chief just gave us some examples. What are your experiences? Right. Well, my experience in Fort Lauderdale has been, candidly, has been limited, obviously. Uh, but I can tell you from past experiences, keep in mind, one of the things that brought about this transition to the, the regional system was the call uh, which cell tower the cell phone hit off of and who got dispatched. 
because there was a lot of confusion. There was occasions where di officers were dispatched from one city that really the issue was in a different city. And if you go back to what happened at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas with the, the Parkland shooting, there were issues related to that too, as, as to how many people were on the same channel and which agencies were dispatched initially and who wasn't. So Fort Lauderdale wise, I'm not aware of a specific problem that has occurred, but I certainly will look into it. That would be helpful, I mean, especially now that we all are on the same page in terms of uh, uh, thinking this is an issue. Um, and, um, you know, if you could bring that back, I think it'll help us and maybe from the fire side as well. And sure. we can look at it, look at the numbers and see if it's something that we that we, that we can't afford or, or, or can't afford. Um, but I knew that the numbers were astronomical last we spoke. Um, or delved into this 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 issue. So right. not to negate anything that's been said, just to get inf more information to make an informed decision. Yes, we can do that for you. And uh, Chief, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was trying to ascertain when the last study was done to determine what the costs would be. And it was about five years ago. That's the best information that I can get. I know it was before I came here, came back. And, um, and and like Chief said, that you know the startup costs, of course, are are high, and then you know there's the cost of maintaining that as well. And there's also an opportunity to uh, collaborate. I think Pompano is looking to um, create their own system as well, or find something to go to another system to go to. And and like the Chief also said, that there are two cities that are currently operating their own communication system. May and I? to add, and okay. just to add, to finish up. Because if this is the direction we'd like to go in, <clears throat> we're in the process of building a new facility for police, and I don't think we have anywhere in our plans an operational room or function for this particular uh, duty to, 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 to happen. So whatever we do, we need, to, we need to do as quickly as possible so that we can um, be ready one way or the other. That's correct. So it would seem that um, it would behoove us to revisit First of all, let's revisit the the experience we're having in the last 12 months with the county's operation. It may have improved. I understand they've made significant investments in their in their infrastructure and their hardware. So before we re make a decision based on you know old data, perhaps you folks might be able to come to the commission and bring to us perhaps some new data that we can see what the dispatch. Um, uh, timings have been in the last 12 months. That would be the least costly uh, aspect of this. Um, I do know that the ramping up would cost a lot of money and the operation would cost a lot of money. But, you know, what, what price a, a life, right? You know, mm -hmm. if we save a life, I, you know, to me, you know, I know many, many instances in which mistakes have been made, wrong addresses have been given, uh, no one answering, you know, for for the county to say, well, we can't hire enough people, well, that's because they're not paying enough, you know. So there's always an answer. There's always a solution. Um, and to just, you know, sit on one's hands by saying, well, you know, we just can't hire enough people, that's never an answer to me. But uh, especially when we're dealing with life and death like we are here. So um, why don't we, uh, if we, if you don't mind, I guess the commission could just see if you could report yeah. back with a history of yes, what's we'll work together for a Okay, all right. And, and then let us know if it's something that you desire. I mean, that helps uh, our decision as well, so. Uh, yeah. May I also, Chief, you mentioned other cities. I, I just wanted to note that, um, for instance, Coconut Creek, I believe, just joined up with Coral Springs. Yes, they did. And um, so maybe, maybe we hey, look at what it would cities? take to join up. Yeah. Well, Plantation borders us, pretty much, and they have their own system, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we find out what we do if we piggyback with an already existing system as opposed to creating our own, if it would just be two, three cities, but Plantation has their own, and as I said, Coconut Creek just went with Coral Springs, so maybe we can investigate that as well. Okay, if you, don't, if you, if you could, all right. Great. Definitely, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Back. Great, thank you, thank folks. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, Moving on to uh, business one, this is a discussion regarding the appointment of the interim auditor. I believe we asked that this be put on the conference report because when we last discussed this at our last meeting, um, one of the prospects was not in attendance. We didn't ask them to be in attendance. So uh, Mr. 
Mr. Pat uh, Riley is here, and also we have uh, the Markham as well. Okay, so um, Mr. Riley, how are you, sir? Great, thank you. Okay, so I, 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 um, if you, ha I don't know if you have any comments you'd like to make, but I think maybe one or more of the members of the commission may have some questions of you, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Sure. Do you have any introductory comments you'd like to make? Well, I can give you a little background about myself. My sure, well, that might help. <laughs> Okay. Break, break the ice here. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, my name is uh, Pat Riley. I uh, grew up in uh, South Florida in Miami, attended FSU University. I uh, got my CPA license, worked in public accounting for a while. Mainly my um, audit and uh, accounting experience has been uh, in the governmental. I worked uh, in Miami-Dade County Audit Department, and in the last uh, from for, for 20 years, I worked in the Broward County Schools uh, Audit Department as Chief Auditor. There, I did multiple audits, um, operational audits, financial audits, um, fraud audits. Um, I worked closely with the State Attorney's Office, this, um, the Inspector General's Office of the Department of Education, FDLE, and, and multiple um, other um, you know companies and outside auditing firms and so forth. Um, I've uh, managed a staff of 25 um, employees um, during the period in, uh, Dade, in uh, Broward County, and um, I, um, you know, I recently, well, not recently, it's time flies, but I've been retired for a, a while now. I've been, um, you know, keeping up with my uh, CPA uh, requirements, and I um, look for the opportunity to maybe um, get back into the um, auditing field and um, provide a service to the to the city. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions of Mr. Riley? I just have a couple of comments also. Go thank right you ahead. for coming today. We appreciate it. And thank you for coming out of retirement to consider this opportunity as the interim. Uh, I, I heard you say you managed a staff of 25. Was that your most recent position? Yes. For, for 20 years, I averaged between 20 and 12. 20 and 25 employees at the, at the district. Okay, so for 20 years, you were in that management capacity. Yes. Okay, excellent. I, one concern I have right now, especially in our department, is bringing in someone with that ability to manage a team well and to you know just help them as we navigate um, through the changes that we've gone through and will continue to go through as we look for that full-time person. So I'm glad to hear you have that experience. Are you able to come in and work um, full-time, in-person? Yes. Okay. All right. That's all my questions. Oh, that's it for me. Thanks. Commissioner McKenzie, do you have any um, questions? I don't have a, how long have you been retired? Um, just uh, four years. Just uh, exactly four years. And where were you before? Um, Broward County Schools. Okay. He's chomping at how, the and how, to how involved were you with um, some of the bond issues? Well, um, you know, and we, how does it relate to you and what well, you do? as it relates to me, we're, you know, from an audit um, function, we were um, tasked to do many uh, construction audits of contracts, um, completed projects. We did a lot of um, audits of um, specific contracts related to uh, materials, and there's a very large maintenance operation for the district, which also does smaller projects, and we were very much involved with. Um, also auditing those type of functions within that, that department. Okay, good. Uh, Commissioner Glassman, do you have any questions? No, I'm good, thanks, Mayor. Vice Mayor? Yep, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Pat, for being here. Um, have, do you know or have you ever interacted with any of our current audit team members here at the city? Um, I, I've, you know, over the years, I've gone to so many seminars and uh, workshops and um, We've had um, a couple, um, we've had um, your, your prior um, chief auditor was a, um, a school board audit committee member at, at one time when I, when I was there. Yeah. Okay. And, but I, I, don't, I know, I'm sure I know a lot of them by their face, but not really by their name, you know, for the, of the current staff and um, maybe people who used to work here. Okay. So it's a small team, um, not, not a 25-person uh, team, so it'd be a, it's a little smaller. Um, and uh, as I think this role, you, you wouldn't have uh, most likely, and depending on what the commission would like, but kind of hiring or firing authority. So it would just be helping them work together, 
helping um, prioritize tasks and so forth, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, helping them, you know, maximize their ability to get, get the work done and so forth. How does that all sound to you? Yeah, that's, that, that sounds great. Um, I mean, I, I, from my experience, I always um, prepared an annual audit plan along with all the summary of activities that I had done the prior year and then allow every, all the, I had a kind of a unique situation where, I, you know, I, I worked for um, directly to the, for the superintendent, but I also worked, uh, at, there was a dotted line on the chart of organizational chart to all the nine board members. Plus, we had um, 11 audit committee members and any of those um, group, the 21 total could ask for audits and um, you know, we would prioritize what they would like and, and we would uh, go from there. So I had, I pretty much knew what was, I was supposed to do on an annual basis and we made, you know, every effort to make all the audits. You know, there was often, often times where, you know, at a board meeting they requested something that is, had higher um, urgency to take a look and maybe something would be dropped off. But um, we pretty much, um, you know, attended all the uh, school board meetings, workshops, and were always available for um, any questions or any uh, research that needed to be done. Well, great. I think one of the important roles of the interim city auditor is going to be just supporting and helping develop the team that we've got. Mm -hmm. The interim position, that, that person might not be here for, you know, uh, for a long period of time, but, but for a short period of time. So I think that's, that's really important to cultivate and support and grow the team. Um, also, the interim, again, at the will of the commission here, but I think the interim would be able to apply to the permanent role if, if they're interested. So how's that, those kind of components, that all makes sense? Sure, or? that sounds fine. Okay, okay, great. All right, thanks, Mayor. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, sir. I have no further questions. <clears throat> I understand uh, we have a couple people from Markham who have uh, – sign up to speak but just questions i think we had the question of uh who would be assigned you want to come up to speak good afternoon gentlemen good afternoon honorable mayor and you know, commission members my name is maurice i'm with mark I'm, I'm one of the audit partners for the government practice and for the record we're located at 450 east las olas boulevard Ninth floor, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33301. And with me here today is my colleague, Scott Montgomery, which will serve as your internal designated auditor. Um, a little bit of history from our firm. We are a national firm. We're ranked the top 15 national firm in the U.S. And um, we specialize in the government sector. We service around 250 local municipalities across the U.S. and just over 50 in the state of Florida. And this is what we do year round. We don't focus on financial institutions, non for profit school districts. That's not what we do. All we do is local municipalities in the state. Um, a little bit about the proposal that we had shared with you earlier. We had designated Mr. Scott Montgomery. He's available for any questions, but with the intention to be here several days a week and also to be present at any commission meeting as well to provide the training necessary for your internal staff. Um, Scott. So um, when you say he would be available several days a week, so it's not a five-day-a-week kind of re uh, responsibility you're looking sure, at? Sure, sure. Um, we've done this a assignment for other cities, currently engaged by the uh, city of Gainesville. We've done this with city of Deerfield Beach. We've done this with village of Key Biscayne, and we believe um, that it's it worked rather well to be two to three days a week. We could do a full week, five days a week if you like, um, but our experience... Uh, does not foresee the need to do so. So would Mr. Montgomery be working for other cities at the same time as he'd be working for the city of Fort Lauderdale? Um, yes, I'm Scott Montgomery. I do um, various other cities, but um, we thought two days um, would be sufficient to oversee the team. Two days? Two days a week. Yeah. Two days a week. So what is the, what is the amount that, uh, that you were going to be charging us? Was it by the hour or was it a flat fee? Yes. We, we did it by a, a, our, the way our firm works is we have an hourly rate. Um, the hourly rates for government entities are at a 40% discount of our regular hourly rate. So the hourly rate that was included on page 12 of the proposal is based on the public sector. It, which was what? 225 an hour. So you have 225 an hour for Mr. Montgomery. 
and then you have yourself in there for 300 an hour. Are you also going to be participating in the auditing process? It, it was designated as desired by the city. Our, our firm has technical resources, has IT resources, it, depending on the need, um, if desired. We believe that Scott Montgomery, and I know that Scott Montgomery will, be, will suffice. Um, we just gave you a, a little bit extra flavor of what resources we have at the firm. Okay, so let's say we just, uh, let's say Mr. Montgomery was the only person involved. So at 225 an hour times eight hours a day, you're looking at uh, 18, uh, you're looking at uh, $1,800 a day, <clears throat> if my math is correct. Mm -hmm. um, and twice a, twice a week, that's $3,600 a week times uh, four, four, time, four weeks. So that's about... Um, about fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars a month, and what was uh, what was hundred an hour? How much? I believe it was a hundred dollars an hour. Am I correct? That's a hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, a hundred dollars an hour mm -hmm. um, for forty hours. That's four. That's four thousand a week. Uh, so they're about the same for twice as much engagement. Correct. Am I thinking correctly? Okay. Well, pretty good. I mean, you know. We're not a part-time enterprise. That's what concerns me. You know, we're, we're, we're a busy city. We have a lot going on, and I'm sure other cities that you represent have a lot going on too, but we really need someone hands-on. And you're here telling us, well, we'll show up a couple times a week maybe. And that's, that's not what we – I mean, that's not what I'm looking for. I agree. So, all right. Does anyone have any questions? No. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Commissioner Marais, you want to make a recommendation? Uh, well, I, I do have a recommendation. I have some um, comments also based on my experience over the past couple weeks. It's been... Um, you want to be the auditor? I know. I was thinking <laughs> about that. If I could get my CPA, you I could... Um, you need a job? <laughs> I'm just not... One motion. Can I second that? All we have to do is take the card. Yeah. You, you'd hire... I, uh, well, anyway. She's always saying things don't add up here. So. Things don't add up. I, I wish that's just not my wheelhouse. I, uh, I do. That's why I appreciate them so much. Because, anyways, I, I actually enjoyed the just working with them and talking about their team and you know how we can work together. That's actually the kind of stuff I enjoy. Your department and I, um, I, I really. Quiet you. <laughs> I really am here to report that we have an amazing team uh, in our in our city, and I'm very. It was it's really been great getting to know them, their skills. I mean, their uh, the experience they bring to the table. You know, they they a lot of damage was done in about three weeks, and um, we were able to kind of I think undo a lot of the damage. I, I don't. I, maybe the word isn't damage. There was just a lot of dysfunction when, and I probably will say when. Um, when John left, obviously it left that vacuum, and then you know Megan did try to fill it, but it really didn't work, and so there was a little bit of dysfunction for a few weeks, and then we you know asked Megan to step aside in that leadership role, and and then the team you know I met with them yesterday just to see how things were going after Megan was no longer in that leadership role, and they were really able to come together and uh, work well, and really just. Um, you know, be the auditors that we need them to be. And really, in that absence of leadership, they each stepped up and took individual leadership. And, and, and I was really pleased to see that. One area of concern I still have with the overall department, and maybe we can ask all the charter officers also, is I did notice after I um, was, you know, just working with them, once again, I didn't discuss any of their work assignments, what they're auditing, and that wasn't my responsibility and nor really should I be involved in that. Um, I, I just needed to...
the interim auditor hiring and firing abilities in concert with Tarlisha in the HR department. Tarlisha, do you want to? Tarlisha and I worked together with the auditing team um, well, be, the entire we, time. Come on up, Tarlisha. But as as we're considering that, what is your recommendation with regard to which of these firms we want to hire based on the representations they made today? I want to move this thing along. I think that's obvious. Do you have it? Yes, you I, have a Mr. Mr. Riley would be my my recommendation. I just think we have one key item that we may need to resolve collectively as a body before he takes over. Are you able to start today? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, no, that's, that's up to everybody else. But I, I have some concerns, and I do believe we may need to address these concerns sooner than later. I don't think it's a good idea to allow all the personnel, if there are problems, I don't believe it's a good idea to allow them all to continue operating for six months while we're trying to find somebody else. Charlisha, what are your thoughts on that? It's not Speak, on. If you... Hey, I'm loud enough, but... There you go. Okay. Good afternoon, Charlisha Smith, Assistant City Manager, HR Director. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commission. Uh, the question was... Do, you, do you, you agree with me, or, or are you able to help assist Mr. Riley if he accepts this position in possibly um, hiring or firing as needed in the interim if the commission does allow it? And do you agree with me that we may need to give him that authority? Uh, yes, of course, autonomously working with the city manager's office. It is a separate uh, charter office. However, um, as previously mentioned in, in polling the rest of the charter offices that the city right now is pretty much following what the city manager's office does for general employees across the city. With that being said, we have standard HR practices across the city. Most of the charter offices have ado adopted those, but again, autonomously, each charter office runs their uh, personnel staff with the help and assistance of human resources. So do you, um, after working with this team with me over the past couple of weeks, you agree with me that we may need to possibly allow Mr. Riley to hire or fire in the next six months while we're waiting for the full-time person to start? I, I would agree that if we sit with, I have the opportunity to sit with Mr. Riley and give an assessment of my evaluation of some things that have been represented to me by the employees, because across the city, we normally sit with employees to do conflict resolution and deal with issues that they are challenged with in their respective departments. And we noticed and heard quite a few things, of course, in the three meetings that we had with the employees and concerns that have been ongoing. Um, with the caveat again, <laughs> Uh, with that office being autonomous from the city manager's office, there were some serious concerns about the interrelations with the employees and interactions um, over the last few weeks. So is that a yes or a no? Well, maybe you can't say, but it's I my can't. recommendation <laughs> that we, I, I'm sure Mr. O'Reilly seems like a, a quality outstanding person, and I'm sure he wouldn't hire or fire anyone haphazardly, and it's, you know, we obviously don't want to replace our team and, you know, bring in all your, your family members, anything like that. Um, but there may be, there may be concern. I have enough concern. I agree with you, Commissioner. I think that he can't be the head of a department unless he has that ability because that it totally takes away his, uh, uh, takes away staff uh, discipline and, and performance. Yeah. So, so I would, I would support that. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Morais, I would say that um, we, you know, given that authority to a new director coming in, we also want to be mindful of the institutional knowledge that's currently within the department, I mean, within the charter office, and that, you know, any drastic changes to that, you know, the personnel in that office can present some challenges for the city considering all the projects that are out there that they're working on. So to be mindful of that if there are any transitions to take place. Well, as long as they work in concert with you, you know, it, because working in concert with you would allow um, whoever we choose today to understand the, um, the parameters that are, are, that are followed when determining about someone's tenure with the city. So, you know, I think that that would be important. But, um, but you know, because to do it willy-nilly, I don't think any, any department head has that authority. So, um, so, so I think right now the, 
the city the city commission. Well, we're voting on it tonight, right? Right. Yes. So this is just to get direction. Um, does anyone <clears throat> else have any other questions? I, attorney no, I, I, I do think. Yeah. I think you both hit it on the head. If we're going to go um, with an individual, uh, he or she needs to be able to go into the office and um, a take control and be effective. If there's any um, indication of behavior or, or, or folks not um, pulling their red wagons, um, they need to have the authority to um, coach to optimal performance or um, or follow our um, guidelines from HR to to take the corrective steps. And I don't want this to be a meeting saying that it is, is out there, but I'm sure he has experience where he can come into an office, uh, command attention, and um, keep the keep the, you know, the floor of the office. Okay. But they, they need the authority. Commissioner Glassman, do you have any thoughts? Yes. Um, you know, at, at our last meeting, we the consensus was not to have the ability to hire or fire okay. for the interim. Um, I, I'm still actually leaning that way, and I'll tell you why. I just think that, well, do we know that this will be maybe a six-month process to hire someone? Um, do we if know? our past practices are in the indicator, uh, we, okay. we, we go almost a year before we... Um, Especially with Commission Bray. It's hard to answer that question. Okay. Because my thought is that I think I would rather see whoever we select today as the interim to come in. Um, obviously, it takes a while to understand what's happening in the department. I, I would rather see that time spent on seeing if things can work out. I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that we immediately have to let go of people. Um, and I don't even know how a new person would come in and be able to figure that out so quickly. Um, maybe he or she can, but I, I'm still leaning towards actually not well, having the interim person um, do any hiring. Or well, well, Megan pointed out to us at one of our previous meetings how one of the employees in the department was not responding to emails, wasn't coming to work, was getting no re no reaction. And 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 so a person can do that because no one is there to discipline that person. So if we continue that practice where no one has that authority, it's not that whoever we choose is going to go in there, you know, like a bull in a china shop and start slashing jobs. I just think that the very fact that someone has that authority alone is enough to maintain the discipline within the department. So just keep that in mind. No, I, I do understand. And even with the point that you made, I, maybe there's another side to that particular story as well. I mean, I don't know it because... There is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there is. Yeah. See what I'm saying? I mean, I, I always want to hear not just one side of a story. Thank you. Um, I, Thank you, Solomon. There you go. Well, <laughs> it is Passover. So anyway, That's right. yeah, here's the deal. I just still? think... Still? You know, we like to take a long time with everything. The uh, I still believe that we should not um, have hiring and firing right away. I just think the person needs to come in, build the team, make it better, uh, see where we are, and then pass on the baton. That's all. That's my thought. That's okay. all. Uh, Vice Mayor, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with Commissioner Glassman. I think we haven't had an exhaustive interview process. I think we've got two qualified candidates. Um, I think we, we, we take steps. We bring someone in tonight. We hire them tonight. Uh, I think that'd be great. I think we give them a chance to kind of evaluate things. They can, you know, report back to us, you know, how are things going? How, how are, are there gaps? Are there opportunities? And, and then we can look at, you know, uh, supporting them. And, and we don't have to oversee every hiring and firing decision, but, um, you know, kind of grant that that ability once we feel there's a comfort and an understanding and so forth. Okay. I don't right. think we need to give that up front. Are we able to so, come oh, back and grant that yeah. authority at a later date? It, <clears throat> if Mr. Riley feels like he comes to us as since we're his boss and he comes to us and asks for that ability, we can at that point grant him that ability? I think we can. Alan, can you? Here's you can as long as it's not in any way, shape, or form seen as providing that interim direction with regards to how to do that. So right. it would have to be a general yeah. across the board. Exactly. I think that right, makes we'll, sense. We'll think of, we, have, we have between now and tonight to think yeah. about it. Right. I just want you to think it over. Um, I, it is my recommendation, and it's my recommendation based on my interaction with everybody. And if, you, if we choose not to go that direction, that's fine. Uh, I do um, strongly suggest, though, that we, full, we ask all members of the auditing team to come to work in person 40 hours a week unless they're on leave. 
That's a given. Agreed. Okay. I agree. That's well, and and I agree, Commissioner. And when you're saying the um, it's the wish of the. I just want to see if I'm understanding right. Are you saying the the auditing department that you've been interacting with, they would like the head to have hiring and firing ability? No, I don't think it's that. No, they're not asking. Oh, okay. For that. All right. It's it's me working with them and seeing some of the dynamics. Sure. Um, yeah. And 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 thinking that um, maybe it's it may be better to you know move forward and you know, make some changes sooner than later. But I think um, Mr. <clears throat> Riley, if he can come in, we're, we're missing that leadership right now. Right. I agree. Maybe if he comes yep. in and provides the leadership, then it will work out to put everybody kind of back in their lanes right now. And I've seen um, most of the team kind of come back yeah, and good. perform at, you know, higher than, you know, I expect. Um, I haven't seen that from everybody. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Commissioner Moritis, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that I'm being fully transparent because you were charged with the responsibility of finding out exactly what was going on in the department. I don't want to delve into everything that took place, but there were some serious concerns that need to be addressed. We do need somebody in that office on a daily basis because of some of the challenges that or the issues that arose over the last few weeks and the transition from the previous auditor. Um, I do know for a fact that if we are in the national search or we're going to engage the firms in the national search and not do an immediate appointment, that I think that the latest date would be 180 days. From what I experienced from my experience in human resources, that is too long to have someone who does not have the authority to make full decisions in that office. Um, and I just want to make sure that I leave the commission with that because you need to be informed of that because the staff needed help and they appreciate it. They're here, um, you know, uh, not to speak to them, but they were asking for help and are still asking for assistance and navigating um, how to manage the office. Not doing their work, but the leadership component is absent. And with that, uh, six months is too long from an HR perspective, and I believe that the city may have some exposure leaving it open for that long uh, without the proper authority to make decisions in the office. Yeah, how about, the, <clears throat> completely fair, Charlie, how about if after a month of, you know, employment, the interim auditor gave us a report to the commission, how are things going at that point? We can say, okay, we'd like to grant a hire and fire an authority. Absolutely, that, because that the interim who's coming in needs an opportunity to make that? their own assessment and evaluations right. of employees. Agreed. The work that's being done and learn the policies and procedures on how, how we operate within the city. I would not expect someone to come in today and start firing people tomorrow, but I, I would expect them to come in and make sure that employees are adhering to policies and procedures, showing up for work and things like that, um, which has been a concern and re representations made by some of the employees that what other employees weren't doing. And I don't want the city or the commission to have the opportunity or the inkling to take that information at face value. I, I think that's unfair to the rest of the employees. Yeah. So only one employee had an opportunity to speak. And that was, I, I don't want the commission to rest with that and make a decision based on that in a vacuum. May I speak? Alan, do you want to weigh in on that? No, I just, again, want to caution that I don't <clears throat> want to get the commission to get too involved in the Correct. personnel issues or whatever is going on with the personnel issues, <clears throat> even going down the line, uh, such as getting reports from the interim auditor as to what the personnel issues in the office may be. Um, that's more for your protection than anything else. But <clears throat> Correct. Trying to keep the commission out of that. Again, if there comes a point where either you do it initially now or at some point in the future, <clears throat> you give the general authority for the interim auditor to do that, then it should be that very general without specificity because you don't want to be seen as reacting to a personnel decision and granting additional authority to that person based on the information you receive. Agreed, and I will work so. with the auditor to make sure that they're aware of the policies and procedures in the city. Commissioner McKenzie? I have two, two concerns. One is, thank you, Tarlisha. I think you really solidified why I would want a person to walk in there day one <clears throat> with authority. So thank you for that piece of it. Two is, um, we asked a colleague to go look at that office. Um, I think the colleague did an exceptional job and recognized something beyond what we can see from the policy perspective up here and trying to keep that arms reach that the city attorney spoke about um, in terms of our responsibility, um, asking, recommending, and encouraging us to, to 
to give that authority day one. We had interims before, i.e., city attorney, day one authority, i.e., city manager, day one authority, David, um, Jeff prior to him. I think you have to have that when you go in the door, um, how they exercise it in conjunction with HR, uh, I'm comfortable with that day one. Otherwise, if there's already um, some rumblings beyond the walls, those folks need to understand that day one, this person is the person that that voice you should hear the, and the direction you should take from because they were already confused um, a couple of weeks ago and infighting. Um, and I think it's because of how sudden uh, the, the, the the director or that officer uh, left that office and you didn't know who was on first. So I think they have to move forward. Uh, I recommend to my colleagues uh, that we, we give them that authority day one and we just monitor through, through um, HR, um, uh, the, the, the process on that. If we have to pull back, we pull back. But I think we just need to come out of the gates um, with that authority. All right, we can decide that tonight then. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And I do, I would like Mr. Riley, if he's available, to start as soon as possible. Not really tonight. <laughs> I was kind of kidding about that. But well, we'll see who we decide uh, on tonight. Go yeah. home and get your lunchbox, though. Yeah. <laughs> you can take a break. It's gonna Thank you, Tarlisha. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, are we going to, are, are we going to kind of at least get a, Tonight is on an agenda item, so we got to vote on it tonight. Yep, I understand. Are we going to at least get a consensus right now of which candidate we would like uh, to move forward with? We don't have to vote on it, but I think that would benefit maybe both applicants, so one of them, you know, knows where they want to go. Yes, it's my recommendation to uh, pick Mr. Riley. I mean, based on what I've heard and what the, I think the team needs, what you all discuss. Do you have an idea of who yeah. you prefer? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm comfortable with that. Okay, Commissioner Glassman. Same. Okay, so we have a consensus there. You didn't All right. Ask me, but I already said it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're listening. All right. Thank you. Um, and we'll decide that the sort of <clears throat> scope of the responsibilities will be tonight, also. <clears throat> All right. Moving on to. Uh, um, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, B two. <clears throat> Uh, who's going to give us a presentation? So, on Mayor, we have <clears throat> Enrique Sanchez. He's prepared the presentation, and uh, we'll elaborate further. Great. What was that? Enrique Sanchez. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Enrique Sanchez, uh, Parks Deputy Director. Um, here with us is uh, Matt Fursester and Brad Davis from Kitten Corn, who uh, were the consultants who prepared our master plan. Uh, they've been working on this plan for about a year now and uh, have a draft report to uh, the commission to, uh, uh, to get comments and um, uh, feedback before okay. uh, formal presentation. Great, thank you. Enrique, Mayor, Commissioners, thank you. Um, so, like Enrique said, we've uh, been embarking on this uh, lighting master plan for about a year now, and the goals were to improve safety in the uh, city of Fort Lauderdale, uh, reduce the number of pedestrian um, incidents and motor uh, vehicle accidents within the city. Um, some of the goals here that you see on this slide are, can you guys see the slides on the screen there. Um, some of the goals that were associated with the lighting master plan are shown here. Um, these goals were uh, prepared in coordination with multiple city departments and input from the public. Um, we also have the needs that these goals are meant to address throughout the city and some of the benefits of uh, striving to meet these goals. Uh, the first goal that we uh, strive to meet on the lighting master plan was to establish lighting standards throughout the city of Fort Lauderdale. And these are to um, identify the roadway characteristics that you have throughout the city there and identify specific lighting levels that are to be met on each one of those corridors. 
Um, this will guide the replacement of existing lighting throughout the city and the implementation of new lighting. Um, and it also provides an opportunity for the city to implement data-driven solutions instead of being reactive to resident and stakeholder um, requests. Um, it also provides a uniform lighting level on these different corridor types and avoids uh, light spots and dark spots on the corridors. And it uh, identifies the appropriate light pole spacing to be used to meet this criteria. The next goal we were working toward was to standardize the lighting styles in use throughout the city. Um, the pictures that you see on the screen here are typical light poles that are in use throughout the city. Um, and once we have this appropriate lighting level identified, we want to try to uh, understand what the most efficient way is to get to that lighting criteria. And the way that we do that is to select the appropriate light type based on the different uh, roadway characteristics and area types. The benefit of this is that it provides a consistent look and feel throughout the city, and it reduces maintenance burden because the city doesn't have to maintain uh, multiple styles of lighting throughout the city. We also looked at ways for the city to increase uh, energy efficiency throughout the city. And the two main ways that we're looking at doing that is to reduce the number of lights that need to be installed and reducing the energy expenditure. So the um, energy expenditure uh, reduction is through mainly the upgrade of high pressure sodium lights with light uh, LED technology. Uh, the LED lighting typically has a broader uh, distribution of light, a more efficient distribution, and it also has a uh, enhanced uh, visible color spectrum. The picture that you see on the top of the screen there is a, a comparison between the yellow high pressure sodium lights on the left and the right is a more uh, energy efficient LED light. We the, also... problem, the problem, if I may interrupt, sir. <clears throat> the problem is the the high efficiency lights cast a very unflattering uh, light on everything. Yeah, well, what we want to do is we want to make sure that these LED lights are um, high pressure equivalent. So we don't want to put something that's too bright for there. That's the reason that we take a look at the corridor and what the appropriate light level is. And then we select an appropriate wattage LED light so that we're directing the light in the areas that it's needed. Can LED lighting be shaded in different colors? Yes, yes. I mean, because incandescent lighting is the one we're all used to. And yes. it has a nice glow to it, and it, it's a, it flatters the environment, flatters the street and the neighborhood and all that. If you put these white lights, it's very jarring. It's unattractive. It's hurtful to the eyes sometimes. Yes. And, and I don't think it enhances the, the uh, attractiveness of a neighborhood. Yeah, there, is a, there are different color temperatures. Uh, high pressure sodium is typically uh, 3,000 Kelvin, and, then, uh -huh. and they have similar LED um, lights in that color spectrum. They also have 4,000 and 5,000. So the real stark blue white light that you're, you're thinking of, that's the 5,000 Kelvin temperature, and, and uh, that doesn't have to be installed in the city. We can go with something warmer. Okay. Um, so the other way that we look to enter, uh, uh, reduce the energy cost to the city is reducing the number of lights that are installed out there. Um, we select the appropriate type of light fixture based on the roadway characteristics. So a higher mounting height, brighter light for the uh, uh, higher volume corridors, and something a little smaller scale for the arterials and local roads. That's how we were able to make sure that we're not over lighting the corridors. Um, in addition to the current needs that the uh, city has for the street lighting, we're also looking for future street lighting needs. We, we want to make sure that we're addressing uh, motor vehicle and pedestrian mobility modes, um, and the benefits of those are uh, reduced nighttime crashes and improved safety for the public. Um, we also want to be mindful of impacts to wildlife, uh, specifically your coastal areas along A1A, um, and the city's already making some investments in those areas to minimize impacts to nesting sea turtles. So these are the tasks that we've uh, embarked on through the preparation of the lighting master plan. Um, along with where we're at here today, as Enrique mentioned, we're seeking input and comments from the commission so that we can finalize the lighting master plan and start to implement some of these improvements. Um, the first uh, thing that we did 
uh, as we started preparing the lighting master plan was take a look at the existing conditions. Now the recommendations in, in the lighting master plan are general and can be applied to um, all areas of the city. But we also took a look at some specific locations, pilot locations that the city has identified um, based on the observed nighttime crashes and uh, crime statistics. And the mix of pilot locations is, is spread equally among the different commission districts um, and uh, roadway functional classifications. So the first thing we do when we take a look at these pilot locations is prepare a computer model of the existing lighting. And then we validate those lighting uh, model readings in the field. We actually walk out to the corridor, take a, a measurement at night, and we make sure that the computer model is accurately uh, depicting what we observe in the field. Once we have that, we are able to summarize the corridors that are performing well uh, against the criteria that we've identified and those that require uh, a future investment to meet the, the lighting levels. We also took a look at the existing city policies in place to understand how existing street lighting is being maintained, as well as um, how, uh, what, what is driving the installation of new light poles. Um, we also wanna make sure we understand how the city is um, receiving input from stakeholders and residents and how they're responding to that. So what we found as part of this existing um, analysis is that there's various light pole types uh, in use throughout the city um, and different light sources. So you have high pressure sodium, you have LED lights, you have older metal halide technology, um, and we want to try to standard that, standardize that for the city. We took a look at over 100 lighting load centers that are in use throughout the city, and we, we found that the existing lighting system is healthy. It can support uh, the, the uh, installation of additional lighting where it's needed. Uh, most of the evaluation corridors do need some level of improvement to meet the criteria that we identified. And these lighting improvements that we identified need to be programmed in the capital improvement plan. Some of the key policy recommendations that we recommend for the city are uh, the establishment of a light level standard for the different roadways, as well, of a stand, as, well as a standard uh, lighting type. We've provided both of these recommendations in the lighting master plan. We also recommend that the city provide guidelines to integrate smart technology into some of the uh, street lighting infrastructure. That could include dimming or um, uh, mon monitoring whether the light poles are uh, working or not so that we can respond qu uh, more quickly to outages. <clears throat> action plan items uh, and policy actions include um, putting the lighting criteria in the standard light pole types that we've identified into the land development code and also providing the lighting criteria into the city's design and construction manual. The city's already invested in the preparation of this uh, design and construction manual, and this would help to unify the, uh, the two guidance documents. Here you see the program uh, actions that we're recommending, mainly um, uh, continued public outreach to um, address neighborhoods that have been identified for increased lighting needs, as well as coordinating with Florida Power and Light, who's uh, maintaining a, a significant number of lights throughout the city, and the Department of Transportation to improve uh, lighting on corridors that they uh, have previously installed. Um, based on uh, information that we have available from a recent energy audit that the city had, we expect a 20% reduction um, by implementing some of these lighting standards. Uh, that, uh, again, would reduce the number of light poles that need to be installed to meet criteria. Uh, we anticipate a 34% capital cost uh, uh, reduction by switching to LED lighting, a more uh, efficient energy source. And the number on the right there is the estimated uh, amount that we would need to bring these pilot locations up to current criteria. We understand that some of these uh, pilot locations may be uh, implemented in, in future five-year uh, capital improvement plan that the city has. So we did attempt to escalate that price to accommodate uh, when these are actually or anticipated to be constructed. So with that, I'll... Answer any okay, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Marais, do you have any questions? You have a question. So I um, have noticed some it, problems in my area. It would be the FPNL versus the city lights. So their lights will look different just because of how they're uh, hardwired and all the uh, what the, the changes they're making too. But can we require them to have the same type of light in the same type of color? 
Yeah, the, the recommendations that we made for the standardized uh, lighting types are uh, <coughs> consistent with the catalog that FPNL has, and, and they are similar to the roadway lights that you have on uh, corridors that are being maintained by the city. So the, the larger roadway uh, light fixtures, they are similar. It's just uh, FPNL is maintaining a large um, component of the city right now. So they, there would be a consistent look. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, I, I see this, you know, the big number is 9.1 million if we to kind of do the 13 pilot areas, but I think there are some smaller steps that we can do throughout the city. And Phil, I don't know if it's you or Ben Rogers, but like even in the Galt, for example, I think next to the Beach Community Center, the lights are white, and then the new streets, 32nd and 33rd, those are nice soft yellow. So I did ask in the past if they could match. So there's probably some small gains we can make now, right, you know, as we're moving forward to adopt this in, entire master plan too. So maybe we can include some of those steps in the overall master plan. So. All right, but I think that begs the question, um, what ha yeah, I see some of these pilot program streets that you've identified, but we don't really have authority or jurisdiction over some of the, the lighting there. How, how, how are you going to integrate that? How does that work? Right. So the city, uh, it, it, it just happens that the corridors that were identified as pilot projects um, were, were mainly because those are higher volume corridors and you, you have a higher uh, likelihood of accidents on those corridors. So DOT typically installs those lightings when there's a roadway project and then the city gets compensated for the maintenance of those lights after construction. So part of the um, <coughs> upgrade to these lighting corridors that are on DOT facilities would involve the city coordinating with DOT to upgrade them um, if there's a milling and resurfacing project or future upgrade to those corridors. Well, but if, but if, but if, <clears throat> if FDOT is, if FDOT is installing the lights, <clears throat> um, do we get, do we get a voice on, on which type of light fixture gets installed on that particular corridor? Yes, those, those recommendations are in the lighting master plan based on the uh, corridor type. So what All right, so they're consistent with what our master plan is then? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Commissioner McKenzie, any, any questions? <clears throat> I don't have a question, but I like the comments you made early on about, um, I think Commissioner Wright has said the same thing about the light. The light that's going to shine down, but these are in corridors, am I correct? Not neighborhoods. Uh, we, we took a look at both some of the pilot locations initially had some neighborhoods which which we were aware um, that there was some resident input for uh, increased lighting and in those neighborhoods um, there is existing lighting but it's not um, consistent enough to provide um, compliance with the lighting standard so it's it's uh, sporadic lighting and what we need is a more continuous spacing of lights to meet the criteria um, and, and that's where we would recommend coordination with Florida Power and Light, who's maintaining some of these lights to provide uh, more lighting in those neighborhoods to meet criteria. Because when I ride down the corridors, I never really see a lack of lighting. It's just where we, as commissioners um, in special districts, or uh, uh, ask for this special kind of lights, is where we, like on the beach, and we put those lights in. We know we have to deal with the turtles and what have you, but when, when it's direct it to the ground, you get very little light for pedestrians and, and vehicles uh, on A1A. Um, here on Cistrunk, we, we did lighting and we got beautiful lights, but it's a dark road at night because the lights, again, shine downward. Yep. <laughs> um, we have some solar lights um, that never work. Yep. Uh, and we decided as we move forward not to use that type of lighting system again. But it was initially it was great. So I'm, I'm just concerned about getting the best outage or output or lighting um, that will be um, more durable as we move this pilot program forward. Because I think we all have expressed in our districts about, you know, lighting or lack thereof and if we're going to spend this amount of money you know we get the yeah, best system and, I know, and I, I know you said that in the end um, we're not going to pay for this can you explain that to me yeah you, you're not paying for all of it some of these um, corridors are on roads that the city is currently maintaining al along the DOT corridors um, 
the, the idea would be for the city to coordinate with the DOT for some kind of a contribution because the city or the, the DOT rather has already installed the lighting on that system. The, the city is, is getting reimbursed for the maintenance of those corridors. So um, the uh, Parks and Recreation or Public Works Department I know is in coordination with DOT. They have a list of upcoming projects on DOT roadway. Ideally what we would do is approach the DOT during those projects and make sure that we make them aware that the corridors don't meet current criteria and request that they upgrade that as part of their study, even if it doesn't uh, include uh, a lighting at that point. And you so. said that we, go ahead, Enrique. Um, so, so based off the 9.1 million number, about half that is on uh, DOT roadways, so we would work with them. There are some projects already in the pipeline, uh, and, and we would make sure that they meet the standards set forth in, in our master plan. The other half are city-owned uh, lights or, or right-of-way or uh, FPL, so that would be a direct cost to the city for the capital in improvements there. So that's, so there'll be, there'll be a four point, you know, five uh, million dollar ask in the, the CIP. So for, for, to make, to, to become in compliance for those projects. And then we would work with FDOT on the other ones. And you also mentioned that there will be some, um, I think the writers asked the question, there'll be some lighting in neighborhoods as well in this mm -hmm. Diagram. I couldn't. You could, from the map, you really couldn't see. So, so yeah. So we we focused the pilot areas. We try to be the most impactful. So we looked at crash data and uh, crime data to to select those pilot areas. But yeah. So, but we we created standards for all all types of roadways, whether they're main corridors, arterials, or local uh, community roads, uh, entertainment district type uh, s setup. So. Um, with 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 uh, high pedestrian uh, volume, so FPL has the majority of our streetlights. They have about fourteen thousand of our eighteen thousand uh, streetlight inventory. Uh, then uh, F dot has probably the next highest. And uh, so, so we would work with uh, and, and FPL is primarily in those neighborhoods. So we'd work with FPL. They're already in process of. Uh, upgrading the lights to LED just because manufacturers are no longer making the old high pressure sodium lights so we're kind of being forced to move to LED so uh, we're working with them and we'll identify uh, how to make those upgrades and how to make it uh, to meet the standards that we're setting forth in these uh, uh, in this master plan and how do I in this report how do I how do I find out what neighborhoods those are not corridors neighborhoods so, so for the neighborhoods, we've we've established standards, and maybe Matt can talk a little more about that. But so we we there was very few, if if any, uh, neighborhoods in the pilot locations, just because it was hard to choose, and we tried to focus, we tried to be objective, and and looked at, use the criteria of crash data and crime, for the areas to 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 focus on in the pilot so location. Tell me what neighborhoods. I know the corridors, but what neighborhoods? Yeah, one of the neighborhoods was Melrose Park that we became aware of uh, at the beginning of the study. There, there's uh, an ongoing effort to improve lighting in those in that neighborhood mm -hmm. through FPNL in the city. I think uh, Tarpon Springs uh, neighborhood. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, well, name all the neighborhoods for me, please. I don't recall them all. There was uh, maybe half a dozen that we knew about at the beginning of the study. And, and I want to point out the, the lighting master plan, the goal of the lighting master plan is just to provide guidance for future initiatives. Um, it, the, these recommendations that we have for some of the pilot locations aren't the only ones that um, need or will get improvements. Uh, it's, it's just to guide future so, development. And some of these same criteria is what led you to believe that lighting need to be increased or or install, or I mean, how how, how did it, you get to these neighborhoods? Tarpon River, for example. How, how did you pick that neighborhood? So, so we we didn't actually do the study on Tarpon River or, or Mount. So what we did, we 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 picked mainly these corridors. Corridors. We, yeah. What we yeah based off crime data and and uh, crash crash data, um, we looked at 
what we did is we did create standards for what the appropriate lighting levels should be in local roadways based off you know the the amount of traffic that goes through there the uh the the, the size of the roads uh and, and and that features so that as we do upgrade those lights we have a standard to point to and say you you need to meet these photometrics uh of of, of light standards for for the new lights the new fixtures you you put in so as as the mayor pointed out before you, you don't want it to be too bright you right, don't want right. it to be jarring you know but you don't want it to be too dim either you want it to be appropriate for for the for the specific application and 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 really that's what we try to do in the master plan we did look at some pilot locations to get real uh data but the neighborhoods did not rise up into that level of the pilot locations just because they didn't have <clears> the, the traffic crash or crime that uh, the big the bigger roadways did. so tarpon did right no it did not what about melrose uh well melrose yeah there was an active project there there are no lights in melrose park as you know right so so there there's an active project with public works to add lights in there they've been working with fpl and they're uh they'll be adding lights there and the fpl did a pilot piece of that and gave us some some funding for that as well right i believe i i, I believe so yeah 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 so there's going to be a capital contribution i think public works has been working on that but yeah We've we've been in partnership with them. So when we move this forward, this nine million is 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 Tarpet and Merrill's in this conversation or in this 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 dollar figure or just the corridors? No, Mel Melrose is Melrose is already funded. It's separate. Yeah, that's separate. That's it's already, already funded. funded. Yeah, but we voted not to fund it. We'd already gone down the road of getting them lights because we um, uh, saw the need. It wasn't because someone said I want it. It was a, a need. Yeah. And we went through the whole process, and then we got um, right to the finish line where we had directed staff to go out and get the funding, and we said we're not going to do the funding. So now today we're sitting here looking at, you know, uh, the master plan uh, to do lighting in, in the city. And if Merrill's has been deemed one of these um, quadrants, corridors, uh, I think uh, we, need to, we need to revisit that funding piece because we were already um, – at design, we were already we already knew where we were going with everything. It's just when it got to the funding piece, we we put that on hold, and I had planned to bring it back anyway. But it, it was just um, today we're talking about a master plan plan for street lights, upgrading in some areas, new lights. Here's an area that's never had lights. Here's an area that's that meets all these criteria that I see in what we have here, which is basically on um, the the vehicle traffic traffic. Uh, crime, safety, and that's how we determine, you know, where street lights will go or where we should increase or decrease uh, lighting in the city. Yeah. Yet we stopped the, uh, a program there. I'm not using this this to um, the grandstand. Just look, looking at sure. You know, so I'm I'm not aware of the pro, pro, that, I know that project that stopped. Uh, I mean, no, we did. Not you guys. Yeah. We we did. It was something we did up here. Okay. I think we can go back and revisit it. Um, Sure. But I would like to, um, to to revisit that as, as, as soon as we can because um, there are some serious statistics and, and, and criteria in Melrose that rises to this level of just needing streetlights. Um, I don't have a problem with the master plan. I think I think what we're doing is great. I think it's needed. Uh, but I also would like to make sure that we we uh, look into revisiting that and. Uh, Given that information and sharing more information with this commission, so we can make a more informed decision as to where we are, where we are, because a lot of us weren't here. Uh, uh, two of us was when we started it. Um, uh, as we moved forward and, and had priority meetings, I've always made it a priority of mine to to do that because it was a need um, uh, in that area. So I do want to revisit it as a commission. Um, uh, now I'll probably direct the city manager to bring it back to us. Um, and bring back all of the discovery that we have so the, so the commission can make a more informed decision. I do like the master plan. Um, I wish we had more. And uh, I also would like to remind the mayor that we did the same thing with the sidewalks. And I want to know where we are with that, too, so we can follow back up. Because that's something you and I have been sitting on for, I know, me, eight years. And you probably 32 years. Um, but you know, we, we do these exercises. Um, um, and where does it get and It's us? nice to see that this one's coming to fruition. I'd just like to know what the sidewalk 
presentation is too. Maybe you can just remind us to bring it back. So uh, thank you for the uh, informative uh, uh, presentation today. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentlemen, do you have any comments you want to make, Commissioner Glassman? I, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I did. Thank you for your work, by the way, and I think this is really important, and I would love to see us to be able to move forward with this. I did have a question on your executive summary for goals. It says that the goals outlined below were developed using community input. Can you just be specific about that? What was the community input? That yeah, we had a uh, public outreach meeting in September of 2021. It was a webinar due to the uh, COVID restrictions that were uh, in place at the time. Uh, but we, we provided a uh, public webinar uh, that was advertised on the city's website, and, and we've got some input about uh, recommendations that should be included in that lighting master plan. The uh, comment about the uh, different lighting temperatures, I, rem I remember specifically that was something that asked about during the public meeting. Um, another uh, topic that was brought up as part of the uh, public outreach was uh, the uh, consistency of these uh, light pole spacing recommendations with the um, city's landscaping code. Um, we, we have observed uh, a couple cases where uh, a light pole was uh, put too close to a mature uh, canopy shade tree and, and that affects the, the light level. So um, getting these lighting criteria into the land development code in the design and construction manual hopefully will um, uh, lead to more consistent designs of landscaping and lighting. So I, I remember both those issues being discussed at that meeting. Um, I also, Mayor, um, and this comes up a lot, by the way, my office does get a lot of complaints about lights out, and we hear that all the time throughout throughout the district, and I'm sure the other district commissioners hear the same thing. Um, but regarding the beach, this has been an ongoing issue for so many years, and we all know the balance that we're trying to strike with the turtle situation and the state and fish and wildlife. And Are there any meetings that actually take place, or is there anything that's happening that can improve the situation for the lighting? And I ask that because... I understand the requirements, and I understand, but if you drive down A1A, many times the lights on the west side of the street, they're just not functioning, or, I mean, there must be something that we can do that's better, um, because the barrier island is really dark, I mean, really dark. I cannot, and I was reminded when I was reading your report about, you know, you used information, the data for crashes and crime and things like that, and um, it, it's... For many people, it doesn't feel like a safe environment uh, when going to the Barrier Island. And, and much of the Barrier Island is an economic engine for the city. We have to make sure that the tourists feel safe and people feel comfortable, um, and the residents uh, feel the same way. Yep. But that's just been an issue for so many years. Is there any concerted effort at all from the city, Greg, or anyone that might know? Are we working with folks uh, on, on that issue, or at least improving what we have to the extent where we'd still pass muster for the uh, requirements for the turtle lighting? Yeah, it's a, a timely question. I, I personally just completed a study for the city of Fort Lauderdale and uh, in coordination with DOT and FWC to install lighting along the entire limits of A1A from sunrise, or, or excuse me, Las Olas all the way up to sunrise. Um, Enrique might be able to talk to that. I believe that's scheduled to be constructed by the end of the year. We're currently working with the Department of Transportation, so we'll be installing lights along the entire west side of the roadway um, to balance the lights that are already on the um, east side. And as you pointed out, the, it, it is a dark corridor, and the primary reason for that is because the nesting sea turtles, um, it took almost a year of coordination with FWC to uh, uh, get them to agree for us to install dual color changing lights on that corridor. So during nesting sea turtle season, they will be amber. Outside of sea turtle season, they'll be white. So that will um, make a big difference in the lighting level. Now the mayor knows a few turtles that don't like that white LED lighting, because well, they, they it's a little bit harsh, uh, right? So we'll have to work with the, you know, his friends <laughs> there that um, the mayor doesn't know that he can adjust his bathroom mirror lighting and he doesn't have to have that harsh. That harsh look that's bothering him so much. It and it's be, not flattering. It, it's down. not flattering, exactly. But we, it's not the lighting. But we can win. It's not the lighting. <laughs> hey. It's a, uh, come on, Commissioner. Uh, we have a next item. Uh, we have a next item. But, uh, but seriously, is that what you're talking about now? Is that the part of the that lead project, <laughs> yes. the CRA project? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor, do you have any comments? 
You, vice, you, you. The new vice mayor. Still getting used to that. I'm like looking at <laughs> Commissioner Moritis for <laughs> second time around. Vice guidance, mayor. I know, I know. Um, no, I think it's all been covered. So, okay, yeah, thank, thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, folks. I really appreciate all thank your, you. your work. Thank you, Enrique. Appreciate all that you do, even when we're not in a public setting. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, like. Okay, moving on to uh, Roundup, business three. Roundup? Yeah, we have one person who's chosen to speak. Is Troy here? Yes, he is. Uh, before you speak, um, uh, Mr. Thornburg, would you like to make a presentation? Good afternoon. You know me, I don't do many presentations, but I'll uh, be, be brief on this one. So as you know, in a few, uh, year, year and a half, two years ago, we uh, were, were asked by the commission to uh, stop using the product commonly known as a Roundup in, uh, in our maintenance operations. And so since that time, we've been looking at a lot of different alternatives. We look at the uh, hot water, the vinegar, some other chemicals that are out there. And we're just having a real challenge in, in keeping up with the, um, the weeds in, in not only in the landscaping, but in the sidewalk cracks and along the curb, things like that. And, and it has impacted, I think, the, the visual aspect of the city. So we started to revisit this idea again and looked at um, you know, what's out there and, and what's everybody else doing. I called around, talked to the other directors in, in the county. Most of them are still using Roundup. I think um, you know, we, when we talked about it a couple years ago, there was a lawsuit that came out and, and a jury had awarded um, a, a verdict to, to, a, to a, a person, I believe, and Alan could probably speak to this more, but it was someone that uh, had been a farmer that had used it quite a bit of time and had been in quite a few years. And, and I think with our uh, our operation, our all of our uh, we have quite a few people that are auth uh, pesticide applicators licensed in our department that handle these kind of products, give guidance to people, and I just feel like it's a it's a product that we should revisit on us being able to use in a, in a, in, in restricted uh, needs, and only in, you know when it when it's, re when it's required, but in order for us to be able to keep up with what's going on, mainly as we come in the summer season again and we really start to take off again, it's it's really a time-consuming effort that we just can't get control of without the use of, um, of that type of pesticide. Okay. So we're just asking to be able to try to, to use it again, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, before we begin, can I just ask a question of Alan? Alan, uh, I think the issue came up regarding uh, Roundup, the use of Roundup, I believe that there are two implications. There's the legal risk and there's an environmental risk. I know you can't speak to the environmental risk, but can you please address the legal risk if the city can, if the city were to resume its use of uh, Roundup? I, I don't think it's much of a risk uh, with regards to, as, as Mr. Thornbird alluded to before, the reaction uh, that most of the country had back in a few years ago was a result of one jury that had found uh, liability or had found made a connection with the chemical in Roundup to the particular injury of that farmer. Uh, my understanding from a legal standpoint is to the extent that there are um, exposure concerns, it would be for someone who has, as is typical in these cases, very prolonged exposure uh, for a very uh, substantial exposure, frequent exposure for a prolonged period of time. Um, the applications of Roundup, as I understand it, is very limited. There's not, you're not spraying an entire lawn with it. You're, it's more spot application. Um, and I'm not aware of any seepage or any sort of uh, issues with regards to contact post application. It just deals with those actually doing the application. So like I said, it's one jury. I haven't heard of any other substantial cases. In fact, I've heard of some cases that were Roundup has been exonerated as a cause of cancer. Um, and it's still on the shelves. The FDA, the government has not uh, issued any sort of uh, recall or any sort of prohibition on the sale of the chemical and or Roundup as a product. So if there is any exposure, it would be very, 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 very minimal. Okay. Um, was um, Vice Mayor, was it you that brought up the issue regarding Roundup? Yeah, it was. Good good memory, Mayor. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I brought this up initially out of concerns and some of the um, some of the legal actions that have been taken and so forth. Um, so I've, I've continued to kind of follow it and do do research and to and I talked with city attorney about this as well. And uh, to his point, there was a 
<clears throat> jury trial in California uh, that, that just um, found uh, for the Roundup manufacturer. Um, and so there, there's at least the recent last several years, there doesn't seem to be a clear nexus between uh, Roundup and, and, and medical impacts that, that we're aware of. And again, I spent time with the city attorney kind of talking through this. Yeah. All right. So um, is there a consensus then on this commission as to whether or not to uh, allow our departments to go back to using it? Mayor, may I ask? Phil, a question or yeah, two. Go right um, go right and we did have a discussion at the pre-agenda yesterday and also with the district pre-agenda. So I just want to make sure, though, for the record, uh, are we talking about areas that are specifically like medians in the roadways, sidewalks? We're not talking about areas where like a playground or where children <coughs> could play on a field, whether it's soccer, baseball, whatever. Uh, are we specifically looking at certain areas only for the application? That's correct. So Roundup or you know, gl glyphosate or whatever they call it, uh, the typical name is is a spot weed killer. So it's only specific to the weed that you're spraying it on, just like you would do in your home when you buy it at, buy it at the Home Depot. You go home and you spray the, the weed. But as far as a broadleaf application, we you don't we wouldn't be using ground up, ground up on a broadleaf area unless the decision is to, to maybe resod an, an area. We might kill everything off, but in that case, we would block it off. We would put signs up and make sure that it was... You know, nobody got on it until it was that that stuff was removed. But so it would be more landscape beds, like I say, cracks in sidewalks, cracks in curbs, things like that. Anything that you know, you know, where weeds typically would pop up, uh, but not when a broad, we, not when a broad we, area. Well, I'm sorry. When we do that application, do we put sign little signs? Sometimes I see when landscape firms around town, when they do something that involves you know chemical treatment, they'll put a little post in the ground and they'll have a little sign just warning. You know, just stay off this area for a little bit of time or whatever. Yeah, we do. Do we do that? N not, not for this type of chemical. We wouldn't. If we, we would. If we are doing a, a broad, a, a broad uh, fertilizer or a pesticide weed control on a broad area where, like, a soccer field or a football field where people would be out running around and be in contact with that, then yes, we would stake that. But if we're just going along spraying the sidewalks, the cracks, and you know, a weed in a, in a sidewalk, we would not put a sign there. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you. Troy, uh, do you want to... Yes. And Mayor, I just had one question, too. Oh, Phil, yeah, what ahead. about dog parks? That, that was brought up at my District 1 meeting also. Are we spraying this chemical at Again, our dog the, parks? Uh, we wouldn't be spraying it on the on the, on the the turf area. If there was, uh, you know, maybe in the area of the sidewalk leading to the to the dog park, I mean, we can be careful with that and if, if, if there is a concern there. Um, but if there's a sidewalk leading up to the dog park and there's a weed, you know, then they would probably go by and, sp and squirt that weed. But they're not going to be uh, covering the entire dog park with it. Are all of our dog parks grass or are some of them turf? Yeah, I, I think we'd be lucky to have some weeds growing in our dog parks. I, I, I was wondering if, yeah. <laughs> they, they start, as the mayor said, they start as grass. Then and then it's kind of dirt. dirt. Okay, just wondering. Yeah. Mayor, if I may, just wanted to add more to... Um, what Phil mentioned also to address some of the concerns. Um, the Parks Department today holds 14 positions uh, with individuals that have a certified pesticide applicator license. And that license is uh, given by EPA and they follow safety standards, which also address um, animals, pets, and, and um, children, equipment, and so on. And Parks also would um, require any uh, contractor to have same license so they would observe all safety precautions that are part of that um, program and from the EPA okay um, Troy <clears throat> thank you mr. mayor uh, Ms. members of the Commission uh, Troy Liggett um, I'm president of Middle River Neighborhood Terrorist Association but I'm not here as president I'm representing myself and my husband, who's a nurse and uh, couldn't be here today, but is very concerned about this issue. Um, I will say that I am an attorney and I did my own little bit of Google research and Bayer, the owner of Roundup, has paid 11, is currently has a $11 billion settlement for 100,000 cases involving Roundup. Um, you're correct, most of it is individual users. Um, who have uh, uh, non -hot, have developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, as a result to long-term use of Roundup. Um, but I, my husband and I are personally concerned about the use of Roundup in public parks. Um, we dealt with Broward 
uh, Community School Corporation on this issue. Um, we live right behind the Fort Lauderdale High School, um, and 7th Avenue runs the length of behind the, the, the sports fields there. Um, and they mow that area about once a month, but then a couple times a year, they bring a pickup truck out, they used to, and they spray along all the fences, around every tree, and around all, all the way down the, the street. Um, and the guy comes out, he, I'm sure he's a registered pesticide, whatever. Um, he's dressed in a mask and gloves and everything, and he just sprays it all, and then he leaves. Um, and I noticed that, and you don't really know he's been there until several days later when it's all brown and dead. But in the meantime, the kids walking from school, people walking their pets, it's there. You, you don't know about it. Um, and I find that really concerning. Um, and that's why I took the time to speak today. I have no problem spraying in the medians on cracks, on places around parking lots and stuff. But as long as we know that they're not spraying it in parks where kids and dogs are running around, that's fine. Um, when I read the memo, it doesn't speak to that, but I just want to make sure that they're not doing that because I do think there's something. Uh, I th you're 100% right, 100% so right. That's what I <clears throat> so, but I think Mr. Thornburg has indicated that, th that the applications are not in areas where kids play or where they're likely to, to be uh, in contact with this chemical, correct? That is correct, Mayor, but I want to be specific as well. When we talk about using them in parks, we would be using them in parks, but not in the general grassy areas of the parks. It may be, I guess, again, in the, in the landscape beds and the, along the sidewalk in a park. So I don't want, I want to make sure we're, we're clear that we're not saying we're not going to use them in any of the parks, we, but we would not be in the open grass areas right. of the park, only in specific smaller areas. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Troy. Okay, does anyone have any further? Um, Discussion on this. If not, we'll move forward. Okay. So did we did we give um, staff so general staff, consensus? Staff to, then I think has a go ahead to go back to resuming the practice. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, for what everybody is here, for. Uh, business four. We have several people who sign up to speak, uh, but I think I'd like to uh, invite our folks from FAU. Uh, to come up and uh, they're like family already. Yeah, I feel. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your patience <laughs> with this commission. Uh, you know, it's a it's a difficult process and it has everything that we decide has ramifications. But the first thing I want to ask you, Mr. Gamet Clark, um, I meant to do this before. You have a brother named Tim. <laughs> Yes, I do. Okay. I know Tim. Uh, you look like him. You have the same last name, so I figured it was a, it was a good I am very sorry about that. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway. We can't uh, pick our family members. <laughs> very good. Thank you for coming by this afternoon. Thank you. So please show us, tell us what you've got today. Absolutely. So um, thank you for the warm welcome. <laughs> it's nice to be considered family. Uh, we certainly <laughs> feel the same way. Um, in our, and of course, it's our, our great honor and privilege to be back. Um, we very much hope that you know, we'll be able to uh, continue to work with you to provide you with something that uh, you'll find acceptable and, the, and your uh, residents will find acceptable. So again, for those at home, uh, my name is James Gamma clark I'm a senior instructor at the Florida Atlantic University Geosciences Department. And uh, we're here this afternoon uh, to present to you our revised alternatives for your city election districts. So the brief outline uh, for today's meeting, we'll go through uh, data and the direction that we've, um, in, uh, we've received from the commission. We'll talk about how that data pertains to your existing districts and to the map alternatives that we've created. We will also, um, of course, finish with a summary and uh, discuss a timeline of how we got here and where we go moving forward. So, of course, the data that we've been using in this uh, study up to this point is the U.S. Census Bureau's 2020 Census Redistricting Summary File. And as you stated previously, this is the same data set that's used by all governmental agencies across the country who are engaging in the redistricting process. The only uh, caveat is that when you do this at the municipal level, we must use the smallest enumeration unit possible, which is the U.S. Census block, 
And it, this is necessary to provide us with the spatial resolution necessary when you're carving up a city area. Of course, these census blocks will be aggregated together to form each of the four election districts that we uh, come to. Of course, we were here last week, and at that time, we were directed by the commission to only uh, consider the 2020 data and not to use the previously prepared uh, population projection that, took out, that went out to January of next year. Also at that meeting, the commission requested at least one new map that uh, created alternatives using the 2020 data. Uh, we have created uh, four maps uh, for your consideration. So uh, looking at the 2020 census data, we know that the population of the city of Fort Lauderdale on April 1st of 2020 was 182,000. 760. If we divide that by four, this gives us an average population for each district at 45,690. Ideally, at the end of this exercise, each of your four districts would have this exact population number. Of course, one of the directions we also got was that we should try to use um, neighborhoods as building blocks rather than city, city blocks. Uh, in other words, don't split neighborhoods where possible. And so this makes it a little bit more challenging in getting exactly close to that number, but of course we've endeavored to get as close as possible. So looking at your 2020 data as it pertains to the existing districts, we find that the current commission districts are unbalanced. The total deviation is 20.25% between all four districts. They have a spread of 12.99%. Uh, and of course, the spread is arrived at by summing together the uh, largest district with the smallest district. Of course, this exceeds the maximum 10% deviation from the ideal size across the districts. This is a uh, standard legal protocol that no uh, election district should exceed that 10% spread value. So let's consider the four alternatives that we've created for you since this past, since a week ago, Tuesday. All four alternatives use only the 2020 data. The overall pattern of district boundary changes needs to increase the population of District 1 while decreasing the population of District 4. Each map alternative impacts each of the election districts. All meet standard districting guidelines and the requirements of the city charter. Each map provides an alternate way to improve population equity. And none of the map alternatives arbitrary arbitrarily dilute minority populations, which of course is consistent with the 1965 Voting Rights Act. We also took into consideration uh, comments that we received from communities, from neighborhoods, from the public, from the commission itself. We've taken into consideration uh, the communities themselves, and obviously we're trying to um, not split neighborhoods where possible. The other direction that we received from the commission was to, where possible, um, create an alternative that made the least amount of change to the existing districts as possible. We believe that alternative six, the first alternative that we're going to present to you this evening, this afternoon rather, uh, achieves exactly that. Only three areas of change are made to the existing district boundaries under alternative six. The necessary expansion of district one that we previously discussed occurs to the west as far as the FEC railway north of 13th Street. District 4 contracts in the west. If we talk about these three changes in, in detail, specifically, District 1 gains 3,238 residents from District 2, north of 13th and east of US 1. Specifically, we're talking about the Ponsettia Heights neighborhood and that part of Lake Ridge, which is east of US 1. Notice in this particular alternative, we do not touch the Gold Mile or Bermuda Riviera neighborhoods. They are retained in District 1 under this minimalist alternative. James, I have a, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a question while you're on this map before you go to the next one. Yep. Um, I understand the, this map splits Lake Ridge but minimally, but I don't understand the rationale for it. Because if you look at what you've done, you've taken east of Federal Highway, which is really just a small, it's... East Point Towers, it's uh, Riva, not much more, in that little corner east of Federal. But the relatively small number of people that are there, why can't they just stay and keep Lake Ridge whole? Because if I look at your numbers for the district with this map, it's not going to um, skew those numbers in any way that would affect 
District 1 or District 2. In fact, it would make them more, more equitable, more equal in number. So why did you do that? It's, it's an excellent question. So as you discussed when we, when we were outlining our redistricting parameters, uh, we obviously try to uh, align the districts with major roadways where possible. One of the other redistricting parameters is also to try to uh, ensure compactness where possible. If you don't move that area, or of course a large part of that strip there, and that you can see in the map, uh, is non-residential. If you don't include that, what you end up with is a little funky little uh, hook in the district boundaries, so it's not particularly compact. So we're including that in, in District 1 for the reasons of compactness. Uh, of course, if you were to direct us to remove that, you're absolutely correct. It's not statistically significant. You could remove that from that, that uh, East Point Towers. From that it's district. East Point Towers and Reba. It makes no sense to move that into District 1. It doesn't affect the numbers at all. I was just saying that to James. No, I, it I, I it, get it, it keeps the neighborhood together because right now that's the only split neighborhood, Lake Ridge. Why would you? It's not necessary at all. So I would think that those reasons would trump the compactness <clears throat> argument that you're making here. Just my, right. my comment. Sure. So, you know, the legal precedent, you know, compactness is often given as a reason why you might, uh, you know, adjust the deviation numbers. But if that's the direction that you give us, then that's not a problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be my feeling. I don't know. I can't speak for everyone. Well, but I think I it makes a lot of sense because this, that the East Point Towers has always been connected to, to that neighborhood. So I agree with you. Historically, it makes sense. That's fine. We have no issue with that. Okay. Any Do other you, comments you have on it, Commissioner? Well, Steve, are those your comments for all the maps where they break up that particular neighborhood or Lake well, Ridge? Well, actually, in Map 7, Lake Ridge, the entire Lake Ridge goes into District 1. In okay. Map 8, it splits again uh, like this. And in Map 9, it all goes into District 1 as well. Okay. So this is the only map that keeps Lake Ridge predominantly um, in Map, I'm sorry, in uh, yeah, I it was District split. 2, so like, along with Map 8. So you like Option 6? provided that that little boot stays in District 2. Well, I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm just saying I'm, I'm just taking this step by step right now. I'm right, so playing. let's take it step by step. Yeah. You have the floor, <clears throat> so keep going. Well, we haven't gotten – I interrupted James. I'm, he's going to go to map oh, seven. Oh, okay. So okay. We, can we comment on six now? Yeah. Or just to... No, let, it, let Mr. Gamma Clark continue. Thank you very much. So we're not going to comment on each map. So I'm like, Steve just commented on... I, I don't know the answer to that. Let's... Uh, I just want to know what you want us to do. Yeah, let me think that through. Let me think that through. I think we I should comment. comment. I would suggest you identify a map which best suits your... which you feel best suits your goals. I have, but Steve didn't say that was his map. He just said he wanted to adjust something. So okay. if I see something on 6 that I want to adjust or point out, I would like yeah. to have the same opportunity at whatever time you as the chair designate. Yes, okay. We'll do that. Mr. Gamma Clock. He just took Steve, Steve's change and said, okay. Well, Mr. Gamma Clock just acknowledged, okay, I hear what you're saying. That's all. He's not changing anything. I, I think what I indicated was that if the commission as a whole indicated us to do that, it's not statistically right. significant. And, and, and we did the last time, but then when these maps came out, as a whole, put a hold on me. <laughs> all right. So so let me let Mr. Gamma Clock finish, and then let's – then we'll each have a chance to speak, and you can identify which map, with any adjustments, best suits what you feel is, is appropriate for the city. Mr. Thank Clark. You. Thank you very much. So the other change that we see in alternative um, six is that District 3 gains the 2,182 <coughs> residents that are located in the Riverland Village neighborhood. And of course, this provides the necessary contraction of District 4. Notice this is the only area where District 4 contracts in this particular alternative. So under alternative six, the deviation is improved. The total deviation falls from 20.25% down to 5.59%, while the mean deviation falls from 5.06 to 1.4. The spread falls from 12.99 to 4.45%. It's worth noting of the four alternatives that we'll be presenting this afternoon, this one has the best population equity. So go back to River Village, for example. That you, that I gained how many residents? It's 2,182 residents. I gained 2,182 residents. Yes, sir. That have never interacted with me. And there's a sliver over there you're trying to make it contiguous, contiguous with, which is Sunset Civic. Am I correct? 
So we were asked to not split neighborhoods. So that that thirty four people are moved into district two. So you so you didn't split me. You gave me you put something together. You put something over there that wasn't there. Riverland Village. Are we talking about? Yeah, that's the three thousand or the two thousand one hundred eighty two. Is that contiguous to Sunset Civic? I'm not sure where Sunset Civic is. I'm well, sorry. Where did you give me that? That goes into three. Am I correct? Riverland Village is at you know the, the southern area, is south of Davy Boulevard. Right. Yeah. So you. You didn't want to split anything, but you gave it to me. And Sunset Civic, I have across a highway anyway. So you gave a little piece I had. You gave me a big sliver of residence. And I don't understand why, why that would happen other than four had to lose population. But to me. Well, it's contiguous. It's only border is with District 3. I can't give it to two or, or one. It's contiguous. To, but it's been in four the whole time. And we're, we're moving other pieces of four to accommodate this. We have, we have multiple alternatives that. I know we have multiple, but we're, we're going to choose one of these four maps. I understand. And two of these maps um, will be detrimental for me. OK. I don't but think, is it, District 4 losing any of, anything else except that? In this alternative, no, that's I the only thing. So. They're not, not in this. I'm map. not district four, I'm district three. I just got no, 2,183 but... people I've never serviced before. Well, aren't they in for a treat? Listen, seriously, <laughs> the the idea is that. I got the idea. I got district four needs to lose, so I get, I they're get losing that. in that area. I get all that. Yeah. Perfectly clear. Chris. No, you said that. No, you said district four is going to lose in other places as well. No, but I didn't say that. They're going to be able to move the line in other places to keep the continuity and not split neighborhoods. Sunset Civic was never a part of any one of my neighborhoods. It was across the street in District 4's neighborhood. Right, but they need to lose people. I get that. Okay. I get all that. that. That's fine. I'm fine with that. Okay. I'm just pointing it out. We're, you're just pointing it out. Right, Go ahead. And we've had this conversation. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Gamma Clark. Thank you. So, moving on to Alternative 7. Uh, under this particular alternative, we are seeking to explore the idea that Gold Mile and Bermuda Riviera neighborhoods move into District 2. This was specifically in response to comments that we got from the public. Uh, in this case, because of this loss of population, the necessary expansion of District 1 must occur even further to the west, and in this case, it moves all the way to Northeast 4th Avenue, bordered to the south by Sunrise Boulevard. District 2 contracts in the west while expanding to the south. District 3 again expands south, as we saw in Alternative 6. And District 4 contracts both in the east and in the west while also expanding to the north. Specifically, under this alternative, 10,308 residents are moved from District 2 into District 1, specifically those residents of Poinsettia, Poinsettia Heights, Lake Ridge, and Middle River Terrace. District 2 gains the 5,528 residents of Galt Mile and Bermuda Riviera. Meanwhile, it also gains the 3,240 residents of the Harbor Beach and the neighboring uh, neighborhoods uh, south and east of the Intracoastal. And of course, also the 34 people that serves to unify the Progresso neighborhood presently in District 2. District 3 gains again those 2,182 residents from Riverland Village. And District 4 gains the 2,741 people that presently reside in Sailboat Bend. Mayor, yeah, are we allowed to ask any questions as he's going along? Or... Sure, go ahead. I, anyway, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, stop. What? I asked you the same question. No, no, you told no, me no. Wants to ask a question. But I wanted to ask a question. I wanted to get into conversation. I just want to know your rules of engagement. That's all I want to know. Okay. If you have, if you have, if you don't understand something that Mr. Gamma Clark has stated, that's fine. But don't so like, like for example, Steve. Yeah, don't go into a full. See, Steve, Steve pushed pushed a little neighborhood somewhere, and he said okay earlier. Then I asked, and you said no. Now either we can engage the consultant map by map, or when we have a you question. Know what? I, all I want to know is what is the desire to share. Huh? Just hold off right now. Just hold wait till on. he goes through all the maps. Yeah, so that's all I want to know. All right, wait till he goes through all the maps. It's it's easier this way because you're going to go through all the maps. I think so, too. I, I agree easier. with you, Let's see. go as we're I'm talking, let's ask I'm, as we're I'm asking going the chair what, what is his desire. It's fresh in my mind right now. I, 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 I put a note here because I'm old. 
Okay. And you're like very old. Yeah. Write it down. Riverland, get ready. It's gonna be a treat. <laughs> <laughs> get ready. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a treat. Okay. So, go ahead, Steve. I mean, go ahead. Okay. Steve. Thank you. Stephen, go ahead. Okay. So James, you had said that um, in this map you moved uh, because of public input the Galt into District Two. Correct. And I, and I see that. Um, and I've seen all the emails, and I and I understand. Um, there's been much less of a you know public information or public input or emails or whatever you want to say in terms of south of Harbor Drive. So why is it that none of the maps show basically what we've been getting in terms of public input, just the Galt and keeping south of Harbor Drive in District Four? Why are you every time you're moving the Galt into District Two? You're also moving the rest of the Barrier Island into District 2 when I have not seen that outcry or I have not seen that public information. Certainly. So we're obviously responding to a, a number of factors. The, the main factor that we ha we're trying to obey is the math of the situation, right? We need to make sure that each of the districts have um, population equity, the best population equity possible. When you start, uh, you know, having a net loss of people from District 2, which is what you do, when we make this swap with the Gault and, Rivi and Bermuda Riviera and the Poinsettia Heights and Lake Ridge and Middle River Terrace, and we're losing Sailboat Bend, to make sure that no district exceeds more than 5% deviation, which is our, our real goal, that's why we're coming south of the intracoastal area, south of Las Olas, and into that harbor branch, into the Harbor Isles area, right? It's a question, question of making sure that no district go above 5% deviation. That's our goal. Now, again, if you said that, for example, you know, you really like alternative six where this doesn't occur, right? Again, alternative six is our minimalist option. There are, obviously we're working on a really difficult time crunch. <laughs> we were here a week ago. We were asked to present some new map options. We certainly didn't present to you all the map options that there could possibly could be. But are there other options out there where you can swap t neighborhoods around and maybe work, but the numbers might not be as good or maybe not as good for one district versus another? Yes, of course there are. Uh, so if you said to us, go back and to option six and make some tweaks and swap that neighborhood around, and can you do that, and can you give us back uh, the harbor neighborhoods then? Yes. But of course, you know, what I would strongly recommend is, is two things. Obviously, there's the time consideration, and then also um, I would suggest to you as, a, as your consultant that uh, the more uh, direction that we get to, to put a specific neighborhood in a particular district is the more this process becomes, or the less this process becomes independent, and the more this process <coughs> becomes directed by the commission, which I don't think is in your interest. All right. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. But it has been directed by us. Well, we've certainly taken your feedback, sir. No, it's been directed. Feedback. Well. And it was just I, directed I would... again. It's been directed. It keeps being directed. You keep um, referring back to the mathematical equation, how we started, but we're directing. We are directing. The power is in your hands. I can't force yeah, you but, what to do. So that means we're directing, yes. Uh, so we, we can push back as much as we possibly can. Um, at the end of the day, the decision is yours. I, I, I get that. It's not mine. It's obviously theirs because nothing I gave to the discussion came to fruition. Uh, I would dispute that. Um, sure you one would. Of, one of the... Uh, you know, comments that we received from you was that you would like to see, and your and your um, the members of the public, was that you would like to see the Progresso neighborhood moved into District 3. And we do that in both of the next two alternatives. And also in alternatives one through four, we move Progresso into District 3. So uh, uh, it's not one, accurate two, to say three, that we four. To... One, two, three, and four is not in play. I, I thought we were going to have um, two maps today. We have four maps. <clears throat> obviously driven by us or some other influence out there. Um, and when I was referring to Progresso, I was okay with the first four maps. And I was okay with with 
Um, I think what my resident said is the historical piece of Cistron, which lies between, Progresso was a part of it one time, but it was particularly the Eastern Railroad tracks, Cistron Boulevard, Broward Boulevard, 7th Avenue, which you can really say that's contiguous to everything else that we once had. That's all that they ever gave input to. I was insulted from the Riverland folks when they said they didn't want anything to do with poor property values, we didn't have waterways, and they said all sorts of things at that meeting that were insulting to pe any kind of people. And then now I get 2,183 Riverland people handed to me, and I'm supposed to please that group of people. I think I can, as uh, Commissioner Glass Glassman so eloquently uh, uh, indicated, but I think when we talked about it, we were talking about historical data and things would be put in play. And just like Commissioner Glassman just moved a, a little neighborhood that had no impact, that neighborhood really has no major impact to the tune of 2,183 people. Maybe 300 people when you put the whole Regal Trace in there, but all you talked about were three, was three apartment builders at the western part of that property with 36 people in it. So it was the historic piece that we were crying out. We were fine with rolling the dice, and whatever happens, happen. But once we rolled the dice, we, as a commission, said, go back and don't divide neighborhoods. And we're, we're still pushing the needle, Mayor, uh, in that direction. So when, when I make the comments I'm making, I'm just saying six and seven clearly, clearly ignored it. And you even went as far as to take the, 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 the little strip, the Milton Jones Strip Plaza, and you took that from us. So if we, if I get a 3-2 vote today against that, 6 and 7 don't go in my favor. So I'm going to sit here and jockey or debate or persuade or ask, you know, for that little piece. I'm not going to ask for a whole neighborhood to, to come over because I want to be fair to the process. But each time we get to opine and push, we are gerrymanding. We are directing you to do something different than what we charge you to do initially. So I'm going to speak up. I'm going to speak clearly because even the first time when Commissioner Glassman made the comments about those, I think it was one and two maps or, or one and another map, and when certain areas weren't in people's favors, it looks like everything he said got put into conversation. But when we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you would tell me that this is the, this is the wish of the commission. I didn't wish that. All right, let's Commissioner, let but I, but, yep, hold on. I just, Could, Commissioner, they, I, I'm looking at this whole process differently than you because you keep saying I or what you want. I, I don't. I think that we all need to just remove ourselves. This isn't about any one of us. I agree with you. This is about I, what best suits the city in terms of. I agree. The the criteria that have been established, the equity of numbers, the compactness, uh, the the common interests of an area. Um, those are the things that I've been, you know, trying to face in my challenge uh, in figuring out what map works best. But I've never really thought of really what map best works for me. As I've said in the past, I would just like to give a list of individual people that I could remove from the district, and that would work a lot better for me. You already than, got rid of me. I mean, that would be an easy, an easy task. But I Watch. can't do that. I can't do. I can't do that. <laughs> I, I got I, rid I, of me. I, no. I, I think we're saying. Well, I, guess what, Mayor? I hate to say this, Mayor, yeah, but in all of the maps, your neighborhood is gone from District yeah. 2. You are leaving District 2, and we're going to install LED lights in that entire neighborhood, <laughs> uh, just so you understand. I think we're saying the That'll same be, thing, Steve. That's the first thing I'm going to do. I think we're saying the but same thing, but we got a different outcome. I, I understand what you're saying. But also, to your point, I've actually heard from Progresso Village. They don't like the maps that move them into District 3. What am I supposed to say? Yeah, but again. They want to stay in District 2. That's fine, but, but think about Progresso Village. Yeah. We're talking about some warehouses, right? And we're talking about Regal Trace. Regal Trace. That they don't even entertain in their discussions at the table. So that's one neighborhood you can split because there's not a group of people that have been planning all these years with Progresso. Keep the warehouses. Keep them. Keep the little community you created, but give us back the history. Give us back the downtown we once enjoyed. Give us back that little piece in between there that they don't want anyway. 
Well, we could debate that, but I, I've made my you point. Said it. I, I know, but I've heard from Progressive Village, the Civic Association. Right. I'm just, I'm. And I've heard from folk, folks from Progressive saying, we would love to be with you. I mean, am I some kind of monster? No, as I said, Riverland is in for a treat. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. I think, I think you know, this is way past us. This is, this is going to be for the next 10 years. That's why I'm saying this is really not about any one of us. This is about the city districts going forward. And you know what? How many people remember from 10 years ago what was in District 1, what was in District 2? I what do, was because I was asked from my, I know from you my know, I know to get this little piece back. Right. But Numerically, everybody... But, Numerically, it works, but when we start doing what we're doing now, it's never going to work because Progresso said, Dorsey Riverbend said, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, Galt said, uh, Poncietta Heights said, uh, uh, what, someone's going to say something. Jackie Scott says, and no, no pun intended, but we're all looking for something in the day that, that will best suit us. So, I mean, let's, if we're going to do that, let's really look at the cards and let's deal them. Let's deal the cards. My point is everyone will adjust. Everyone will adapt. The commissioners will work just as hard as always. Everybody be, will be serviced. And probably in 10 years when we do this again, no one will even remember the changes that were made from the last census to this census. I don't That's agree all. with that. OK. All right, let's continue. Hold on, hold on. I've, Come on. Yep, hold on. I've, I've got something to say, Mayor. Thank you. Oh, we got something you to say. Something to say? Okay. Thank you, thank you, yes. That's uh, the vice mayor, by the way. The, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to remember it. Um, just. Uh, Commissioner McKenna, well, one's, one other point is, and I think um, when you're referencing the feedback, I, I'm guessing it was Lauderdale Isles neighborhood that was talking about. Um, talking to me? Yeah. Because you, you referenced like um, Riverland was upset about something, didn't want to leave District 4 or something. You just mentioned. Is that a meeting? It was at the oh, meeting. meeting. Yeah, yeah. And I'm saying I think that was Lauderdale Isles uh, uh but they, they, share, association. they share a neighborhood, okay, that can be contiguous. They They're share a neighborhood that road. can be, don't, because so, when you start saying a lot of the owls, we're back to what Steve just did. And what I'm talking about is moving a piece, moving a piece. A lot of the owls is the winding owls at the tip of Riverland Road, as we once knew it. Oh, I know where and it is. Yeah. I know plenty of folks back there, personal friends. But when they came right. to the meeting and said, you guys have lower property values. You guys don't have waterways. We have nice property values. We have two waterways. If you remember, and I had to recall this guy, you have one channel of water. We have two. Mm -hmm. We have two. Fort Lauderdale is the Venice of America. The neighborhoods are separated by waters. For him to say that in a public meeting, when the room was filled with Dorset Riverbend folks and yeah. Doors and others, it was a few people from Lauderdale Isles that only cared about their backyards, their yachts, and what they wanted, and they clearly pointed over to the other side and said, we don't want to be with those people. Okay. So all I'm doing is making the distinction that that was the Lauderdale Isles Civic Association was making that. They can be contiguous to the people they were contiguous before they came in here and tried to change it. They were, they were neighbors. The, okay, I'm just helping you understand. It wasn't... You're just making your point, of, you're making your point of But you're bringing me into the debate. You and I are fine. Yeah. But Lauderdale Isles insulted black folk that day. Okay. When was the last time you heard me use the word black around here? Okay, Mr. Gamet Clark, can you continue, please? Uh, moving on to Alternative 8. The goal of Alternative 8 is specifically to move the uh, entirety of the Progresso neighborhood into District 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. For contiguity reasons, this necessitates a couple of things. Firstly, Sailboat Bend must be moved into District 4 if the progressive neighborhood is moved into District 3. <laughs> Secondly, Lake Ridge, specifically that portion west of US 1, must remain in District 2. Otherwise, both the Middle River and South Middle River would be cut off from the rest of, the, of District 2 under this particular alternative. Just to note, both the Gold Mile and Bermuda Riviera <clears throat> remain in District 1 under this particular alternative. So to go through the changes, Again, we have um, 3,238 people belonging to Poinsettia Heights and that part of Lake Ridge east of US-1, which was the area that uh, Commissioner Glassman was referring to before, being moved into District 1 under this particular alternative. 
District 2, meanwhile, gains 1,185 residents <clears throat> from the Sunrise Intracoastal neighborhood, in addition to uh, Galleria Mall being moved into the district. And then again, we also see that 3,240 number, uh, <laughs> those residents who live in Harbor Beach and the surrounding neighborhoods. In this alternative, uh, District 3 gains the 2,569 residents that are found in Progresso uh, all the way out to the FEC Railway, whereas District 4 gains the 2,741 people from District 2 north of the New River, that is the Sailboat Bend community. So deviation is improved under Alternative 8. The total deviation falls from 20.25% down to 14.8%, while the mean deviation falls from 5.06 down to 3.7. The spread falls from 12.99 down to 8.3%. Finally, we have Alternative 9. This alternative tries to create districts where both Progresso are moved into District 3 and the Gold Mile Bermuda Riviera neighborhoods are moved into District Two. Again, District 1 must expand further to the west when you move Gold Mile and Bermuda out of District 1. And so in this case, it's the non, uh, we see that occurring uh, all the way out to the FEC Railway north of Sunrise Boulevard. The non-residential portion of Progresso remains in District 2 under this alternative to help maintain contiguity between uh, Middle River and South Middle River and the rest of District 2. District 2 must also expand to the south, east of the Intracoastal Railway. So specifically, again, we're talking about now 6,453 residents belonging to Poinsettia Heights and Lake Ridge being moved into District 1. District 2 is gaining the 5,528 residents in Galt Mile and Bermuda Riviera and the 3,240 residents that are in Harbor Beach and, this, and its uh, neighboring communities. District 3, in this case, is gaining 2,553 people from District 2. So that's that portion of Pro Progressive Neighborhood uh, that's found to the west of Andrews Avenue. And finally, District 4, again, is gaining the 2,741 residents of Sailboat Bend. So under this alternative, we find that the total deviation does fall. It falls down to 14.73% with a mean deviation of 3.68. But we also find that the spread falls to 9.89%, which of course is just below the acceptable 10% deviation threshold. To summarize, here we see all four alternatives that have been presented for your consideration this afternoon. Uh, you can see that again, alternative six has the best population equity. It also impacts the fewest number of residents at just 5,454. Um, of the four alternatives, only two of them split a neighborhood. That is alternative six and alternative eight. That's the Lake Ridge area that uh, Commissioner Glassman was uh, referring to. Alternative seven splits no neighborhoods. Alternative nine also splits no neighborhoods with the exception of the non-residential portion of the Progresso neighborhood. Here we see the four alternatives that we prepared for you for your consideration on a side-by-side -side basis. And finally, uh, allow us to review the timeline that got us here. Obviously, on March 7th, we submitted our initial district analysis. On the 15th, I was here. We had a commission meeting where we outlined how the process would go and what your existing deviation would look like. On the 17th, we had a public outreach meeting where we got comments from the public. On the 21st, we submitted our first report, and on, during the period of March 22nd through the 5th, we had a public comment section. On the 5th, we had a meeting with you, and at that time, uh, the initial four alternatives were rejected. We were asked for a fifth. The first reading was deferred. We came back on the 12th, uh, and at that time, we were given yet further direction to only use the 2020 data and to prepare at least one new alternative we came back to you with four. Um, the 15th, we submitted our latest amendment to our report. And of course, here we find ourselves having a commission meeting. Hopefully, we'll have a first reading this evening. And then in the near future, 
you'll have a second uh, reading and hopefully adoption, and then you can submit your new maps to the supervisor of elections. And with that, I'd be very happy to. So before, you, before we go to questions, I think we should ask the public to speak. There are a few people that have signed up to speak. So if we could do that. Mr. Barrasso, everything that was said today, you, where is Mr. Barrasso? You're, you've signed up to speak, but you're, you're just here for answering questions. Right. Uh, Mary Pelliquin, Mary, are you still here? Oh, there you are. Followed by uh, Fred Nesbitt, followed by uh, Troy Liggett again. I have too much stuff. Okay, I'm Mary Pelliquin. I'm uh, representing the Council of Fort Lauderdale Civic Associations right now. I am the president of that group. We represent 50, maybe a little bit more, civic associations right now throughout Districts 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, I just saw these maps last night. They were kind of new to all of us. I sent them out to the district reps for the council. There's four of them and the vice presidents. Um, I'd say about 5.45 a.m. this morning. I've gotten some answers back. The uh, consensus is uh, everybody likes option six. I mean, I thank you guys for doing this again. Uh, we did ask that no civic associations be divided. There is, as Commissioner Glassman mentioned, uh, a little bit of Lake Ridge, I think two condos. I don't know, we, we can work with that. Um, I don't know if there's any way you can put them back, but if not, we can figure that out. But that uh, particular map is the least disruptive. It is the most equal and nobody objects to it. That's the biggest part of all, nobody objects to it. There's objections to the other maps. Um, the uh, Harbor Inlet areas down in there, they don't want to be moved. Um, they don't want to be moved out of District 4 because of the those, there's a couple of neighborhoods in there because they feel like they're part of 17th Street, something to consider. Um, the other thing, now I'm going to speak as Mary Pelliquin, a uh, board member of the Coral Ridge Association. I've lived in Coral Ridge for over 30 years, raised, I don't know, I have had a lot of kids that raised there. And uh, the one thing I want to say about Coral Ridge is we need to keep the Galleria in the same district that we are in. There is a big push to develop the Galleria could add thousands and thousands of people, and we need to uh, make sure that Sunrise Intercoastal and Coral Ridge, who are the most effective by whatever happens to the Galleria, be in the same district, because it would be very difficult to have two commissioners uh, be involved in the development of the Galleria. So that was that's from Coral Ridge. So otherwise, from Mary Pelliquin herself, I just want to thank FAU for listening to us. and. Uh, doing these endless maps. So thank, thank you. you, Mary. Oh. Thank you so much. Fred Nesbitt, followed by uh, Troy Liggett, uh, followed by Annette Ross. Uh, my name is Fred Nesbitt. I'm the president of the Galt Mile Community Association. <clears throat> I'm not sure I can add much more to this discussion that we've heard. Uh, what you've heard from every, neighbor, every neighborhood is they don't want to lose their city commissioner. And this has created quite a mess. And I would say to the four city commissioners sitting here right now, You've created this mess. <laughs> you've been great city commissioners. You've come to our meetings. You've met with us. You've listened to us. You've asked for our input. You've advocated for our neighborhoods. You've helped us solve problems. So this makes it a very difficult decision. Um, I, I would say there's probably no city in the United States of America where more residents know who their city commissioner is. They've met with them. They've communicated with them. They've talked with them. They've seen them in the city of Fort Lauderdale. And that's to your credit. And, and I applaud you for that, but it's also caused a problem. Now imagine if we had neighborhood associations coming up here today and saying, we want moved, move us out of our current commissioner's district, move us to another city if you need to. You're not hearing that, you're hearing the opposite. So you've done such a great job, you've created this possible dilemma. I understand the districts need to be compact. It would almost be impossible if a neighborhood association was split between two commissioners because they couldn't attend the meeting together at the same time because of sunshine law. I represent a coastal community. Uh, we have a lot in common with the rest of the coastal community uh, down south, south of us. 
Of the coastal community, of course, we've got you know issues like beach renourishment, pollution, rising sea level, and of course, when a hurricane comes, it usually comes off the ocean. And if there's any orders to evacuate, it's certainly the barrier island this is the first area to be evacuated. So I think it's important to recognize that that commonality is very important as you draw these new lines. So I don't envy you this task. I think uh, Commissioner Glassman makes a good comment. It's not really your district, it's our district. And we're looking about the people who live in the district working together, but we're all really part of the city of Fort Lauderdale. So I, I, I heard DeGault bandied about several times. Uh, we don't want to lose our commissioner either, but unfortunately we're losing our commissioner because she's leaving us on November the 9th. So we're sad Seven. that, but Seven. Uh, you know, we, we almost feel like, you know, we, we, two of the maps have us in one district and two of the maps have another district. And so it, it's a very difficult situation. I, I, I know you'll make the right decision for the city and all of us will abide by the decision and we'll move forward again with a great team on the city commission. So thank you very much and uh, for the time and the opportunity. All right, thank you, Fred. <clears throat> Troy, followed by Annette Ross and then followed by Joanne. Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, just very quickly, I wanna thank you for all the hard work you put on this. I think Middle River Trail is probably three issues. Um, you've taken care of our main issue, which is you uh, not divided neighborhoods in any of these plans. Um, I will suggest that two of them, um, two of the plans put Progresso, Progresso and District 3, two of the plans unify the beach. Can you, um, wait, wait, it, it, could you bring the microphone up yes. here? Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Two of the plans uh, put Progresso uh, in District 3, two of the plans put unify the beach, um, and uh, District 7 moves Middle River Terrace away from downtown. So if you're looking at either of those switches, our neighborhood would prefer that you not choose plan seven um, if you go so far as to make those major, major changes because we consider ourselves a part of that development area of Fourth Avenue and we're really more downtown centric than we are uh, anything else. So thank you. Thank you. Annette? Oh, she left. <laughs> Too much. No, Annette had to leave, but said I could say something on there. Okay. Right now, so Thank you, Joanne. Um, <laughs> hello, Honorable Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Joanne Robinson, President of the Harbor Inlet Association, which is one of the et al. neighborhoods around Harbor Beach. Um, and Annette Ross asked me to say that Harbor Beach is in favor of Alternative 6, and I believe she wrote that on her slip because she knew she had to leave. Um, as a neighborhood, our board of directors has voted and we've talked to many of the residents. We feel very strongly about staying in District 4 for many reasons. Uh, we feel our issues are aligned with the south part of the city much more than the beach and downtown. Uh, we deal with issues from the, neighbor, um, the airport, from the port, 17th Street traffic. Um, for example, a few years ago when they were doing the airport project, and we had the um, paths of the airplanes changed, we would not have even known about that project being under development if we weren't part of District 4. The District 4 neighborhoods got together and made that happen. It really has changed the quality of our life in our neighborhood. We feel we understand the numbers game. We're all business people. I'm big on efficiency and um, minimal um, disruption. So for that reason, Alternative six looks the best as well, but it's more than numbers. It's compatibility and working together. And we really, and I know I've sent you at least two emails to the commission. Um, don't know if you got to them in your inbox, um, but since this has been published, we've been pretty vocal and strong about staying in district four for those reasons. It's nothing against any other district. Um, it really isn't, but we just feel that our issues are aligned with the neighborhoods on the southern part of um, the city. So thank you. All right, great, thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, anyone else wish to speak on this topic? We're gonna vote on it tonight. I guess that would be another opportunity to sign up to speak, but uh, we'll start <clears throat> with uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Moritis. Is there preference to uh, what you would like to see um, this commission do? Sure, well, I think the input I've received from my district 
um, well, I guess we have Mary and, you know, in the east side, maybe, maybe Fred a little bit different on this. Um, I have re received some um, assurance from the Galt that they would be fine moving to a coastal district, so moving to District 2, so that would be 7 or 9. I've, seen, I've heard a lot of people say no to 7, so that kind of leaves us with 9. Um, you know, uh, I know one thing Mary brought about was keeping um, Sunrise Intercoastal and Coral Ridge in the same, and I think 9 does that. So I, I think I, I'd probably lean towards 9 at this point. It just, I don't know, you know, Harbordale, I, I don't know. I'd have to hear more, to hear from you all more on this. I know one concern the Galt has, you know, we have a lot of we have projects in the works over in the Galt area. You know, I, I obviously will be here six more months. We can continue to work on them. Um, but I know they'd like, you know, they, they'd be okay with being in the Beach Community District too. Okay. So. All right, Commissioner McKenzie. <clears throat> As I said in the beginning, when we started this process, I could live with any map. But being the District 3 Commissioner, when I was 15 years old, they tore down District 3, block by block, house by house, building by building, history by history. I'm 60 years old now, and we're at the tipping point of making Fort Lauderdale this beautiful place that it is and that momentum going to the western side of the tracks. And the place that we sacrificed, that we said, okay, Mr. Mayor, okay, commissioners, okay, government, was that Cis Trunk, FEC tracks, and Brow Boulevard. People like Greg Bruton, people like Ludian Smalls, Beauregard Cummings, Mizells, Bentons, the names can go on and on and on and on. That was our economic engine. We said, yes, we'll buy in. And they built, Regal, they built City View first and then Regal Trace. And almost 20 years later, we got the plaza. Piece that's in my district now. <clears throat> so I can live with any of these maps, but what I can't live with is a broken promise of that piece. And I heard you, Progresso. You don't want to be a part of us. And yes, we all have done a great job. I would never take anything from any of you. But that piece in any map that we choose tonight, and I will compromise, needs to be included. Just like Commissioner Glassman said, the little bump over there, it won't shift the numbers that much. But it would give District 3 and the folks that sacrifice their lives and their businesses it would give them an assurance that 40 years later, we did the right thing. Some of you weren't even born and raised here. Don't understand the dynamics or, or what has happened, but we all embrace change in our city. We do that. So if I had to pick a map, I would pick nine or eight, eight or nine. If I had to pick a map based on what is here today, <clears throat> What I would like to come out of this tonight is a consensus that whatever map we pick, and I can take the Riverland folks, and they will be very happy, Commissioner Glassman. I make people happy. <clears throat> but six and seven, and I just heard from someone out there, seven wouldn't work for them. But if we pick six, we pick seven, Give me those little blocks. Let me have Sis Trump Park back. Let me have the street where Beauregard Cummins grew up at, just died six months ago, 96 years old, played his first stickball game. Let me have that back. <clears throat> it's just a little piece. It's just about 300 something people. And Progresso, as they are today and as they're progressing, don't even, won't even engage the folks in Regal Trace in any of their conversations. And I'm not saying this to embarrass any of my colleagues, I'm just giving you all the facts, the truth of the matter. I was 15, 
and they tore it down, Jack and Scott. But when you call my house and you call my phone, we ride our golf carts, we do the things we do, we talk about Fort Lauderdale, we talk about what's the next move. But no one ever calls me and asks me what I want. You always tell me what you want and what you want and what you want. Tonight, I can live with any map if we include that little piece of history, that little piece of paradise. I can live with the maps. I can even live with Flagler Village, and that changes the dynamics of my district tremendously. But I can't live, Mayor, without that little piece okay. of history. Okay. All right, <clears throat> Commissioner uh, Glassman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's been an interesting exercise. So first, I wanted to thank you gentlemen for all of the work. It's been a lot of work. Uh, and thank you for uh, listening and, and readjusting everything. And I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate all the input from all of the neighborhoods. And I've spoken to a lot of people on this. Uh, it, it's been tough. It's tough because, I mean, no one wants to lose a neighborhood that they've worked with or a neighborhood doesn't want to lose a commissioner they've worked with. And, and I understand all the dynamics. And that's why I actually believe that map six is the best because it's just the least disruptive. It's the, the changes are, um, you know, they're minor. Unfortunately, Mayor, I do lose, uh, or the next commissioner loses and District 2 loses Poinsettia Heights in every map. So that seems to be a given because where else could District 1 expand to um, unless they came down the Barrier Island and then that would uh, remove my neighborhood from District 2. So it's obvious that that's going to happen and I feel bad about that. Um, but all of the others, the changes are quite dramatic. And, you know, we've heard enough from the public. Um, I, I've definitely heard from folks in the Galt a lot. I've heard from a lot of the different presidents and plus the neighborhood president uh, who's here today, Fred. But the maps that give the Galt to District 2 also give um, south of Harbor Drive to District 2. And it's clear that um, the neighbors in uh, south of Harbor Drive don't want to move into District 2. So that's a dilemma. So every, every which way I look, it just doesn't seem to fit. Um, I mean, there are trade-offs that I think maybe could happen, but then we'd be disrupting even more. So I'm, I'm going to go with uh, map option six because it is just the least disruptive. Um, District two gains no neighborhoods, except I do think that we need to rework that little sliver east of Federal Highway because it makes no sense. And when I look at the numbers now, uh, if map six is adapted, adopted rather, I'm sorry, um, we're still, I think, the smallest district of the four. Um, so it really is, as you said, um, it is a very insignificant addition. So I know what you're saying about Federal Highway as the boundary, but I think um, that that little area east of Federal does have to move back into Lake Ridge, and then we will have, correct me if I'm wrong, no split neighborhoods. Right. Because you're moving that little 34 people from Progresso, you're, you can move east of Federal and Lake Ridge, we have no um, split neighborhood. So when I look at map option six, it really seems to address a majority of the concerns that we've expressed in this exercise the whole time. Um, nothing's perfect, um, but I do think that that option is our best bet. That's it. Thanks, Mayor. Okay. Steve, what is, um, when we're looking at six, or, or Robert, where's the little piece that you said you wanted? 7th Avenue, Broward Boulevard, FEC track. Right across from the Sistrunk Marketplace, so I won't disrupt Progresso's. So is that the tr little triangle right there? No. That, it's not the triangle that well, kind of came down? On, on or the map. point? McKen Broward. Commissioner McKenzie, speak into your microphone. I'm sorry. Or go maybe show us on the map. Go back to Broward. And it's the... Uh, oh, Broward. The, the little... Okay. The, yeah, but it doesn't go as... See that, it, the the see red the line first. to the east is really... And we're looking at six. Yes. I, I mean, on see this... Six. On the, the cursor on the screen? Yeah, but that's nine. The screen says nine. Oh, that's nine. nine. Did you yeah, push it back to six, yeah. Mr. Gavin? Yeah, go to, go to so six on the six. screen. If Robert's you look at six, at and you just go to, again, it, Broward. Okay, so at the end of Broward. Broward is six, Trish. Yeah. Okay. Got to go across that red line there at the end of Broward Boulevard. Okay, so it's. Go just go over a few blocks. Yeah. The FEC track. It's a park. It's some apartments. It's some apartments. It's some apartments. It's the, the strip mall. How many people do we know? Um, I would say they took 36 out when they when they when they took it out of the other maps. 
Uh, I would think Regal Trace would have 200 something people and maybe uh, City View, what, 75, if that? The only issue, if you look at the numbers on page two of their um, report that we have today in the backup, the amendment two, if you look at the numbers, District 3 right now I'm has, over a thousand. has already 2,000 more than District 2 already. I'm already over. I know, but that's You're, because District of what we did. Over. But when, I, when we started this process, I was under. I understand, but map six makes it. So all, all you're talking about is a couple hundred more people. How would that impact? Commissioner, I think more important than, the, than this math problem that we're working on right now is we have to keep in mind the, the contiguity issue. As we expand District 3 to. To the east, south. To the south. Well, to the southwest. Existing boundaries, as it moves east, as it begins to cut off Sailboat Bend, depending on how far. East you want but to we're only it. talking about a couple hundred people here, so we're not. It won't shift the numbers as we did when we okay, first. I'm, I'm not. Con I, at this particular point, my bigger concern is not the numbers game, but the contiguity game. So, if if we're going to move District Three east in this alternative, we're going to have to address Sailboat Bend. If Sailboat Bend is getting cut off in your proposal, it's going to have to be moved into Alternative Four. So, just I just want to bring that up. Wait, what did you just say? I'm sorry. Sailboat Bend can be cut off from the rest of District 2. When you say it can be cut off? Cannot. Oh, exactly. It has to be contiguous. It has to be contiguous. You're so saying if we do this, we cut them off. It will Anyone be contiguous. how far east you move the no, boundaries just, of District 3? Just to the tracks. Don't go any further than that. Just, just that little block. Well, the tracks will cut off Sailboat Bend if we go all the way to the tracks. Right. So well, again, if you want us to look at that, we can do that. But Sailboat Bend will have to move into District 4 in that, this scenario. But then that changes everything. It does. Because Sailboat Bend. At which point, I'd encourage you to look at one of the other alternatives. Sailboat yeah, Bend, we're talking 2,700 people. Because of the people. line, not because of the people. Mm, the because of contiguity, nothing to do with the numbers. Where is Sailboat Bend now? What district? It's, it's this two. Two. blue piece is sticking out at this map here. This Ten years ago, it moved into two from four. Right, and that's when it disrupted my district tremendously. So Why did you guys approve that map then? I didn't approve the map. It was a process of people at a table, and when they got into a discussion like this, and it was going to be decision where the black neighborhood would be just pummeled, they settled for the for the plaza at the end of the day. They, they settled for that. But didn't the commission have to vote on the maps? They voted on it. But again, like tonight, six is going to win, I'm going to lose. Come so you can sit and bring all this history and, and twist words and twist numbers, but that piece, that piece is detrimental to District 3. That's the first development we ever had. And you're going to take it? Commissioner, Commissioner McKenzie, let me, ask you, let me ask you a question. The, so I get the desire to go east to the tracks. Is, is, is the desire, your desire to go all the way south to Broward Boulevard, or could you go um, north of Broward Boulevard? See what I'm saying? How far south do you want to, would you want to move that? Fourth Street? Where does legal? Because if you legal? if you don't go all the way to Broward, then it could still put, potentially be to, contiguous. If you take it to Fourth Street. Does that make that, sense? Then that will provide Trying to make contiguous. contiguous. Yeah, so, exactly. So let's, so let's come up Fourth. Okay. I want Broward. What I have now, but just just take a little piece to make it contiguous. So take like whatever it is over by um, the state building there. I think it is. And there's another. What what would make it contiguous on the map? So as. Uh, Commissioner Sorensen is pointing out, if you're, if District 3 expands along Brown Boulevard, that's going to cut off Sailboat Bend from the rest of District 2. So, and of course, the more you do this, the more the map starts to take on a gerrymandered appearance. However, so if of contiguity only, there has to be a connecting land bridge between Sailboat Bend and the rest of District 2. Now, again, the other alternative is to move Sailboat Bend into Alternative 4. But at this point, I would once we get to that type of map, then you're probably better off just looking at alternative eight or alternative nine. No, because that's gonna just like we're saying, we're we're really trying to so, work this out. Now. Yeah, so, so Commission, let me throw so, it. so let's take but I don't want let me give a suggestion, just an idea. So going to like if the southern boundary was northwest fourth street as an example. Um But that whole quadrant is what, what it was. So yeah. How do we get there? Just cut it. Well, you can, you can go down as far as 4th <clears throat> Street. And, and then go to the tracks for the eastern boundary. That way you keep, that it, contigu you keep it contiguous. With keep it contiguous. 
Because what makes it contiguous? The intersection? Be because south of... Hold on. The yeah, intersection yeah. makes it contiguous? Or the, what makes it contiguous? It would be contiguous because south, just as an example, but you, you can tell me what's better, but mm -hmm. south of Northwest 4th Street to Broward Boulevard, those several blocks would be District 2, which would then connect the, e, the other part of District 2 with Sailboat Bend. So, so it has to be... It has to be... It has to be, has to be Broward is that piece we're looking for, it, Broward and 7th, am I correct? Without that, it won't be contiguous, right? So if you kept, yeah. if you keep City View in District Two, and you keep no, fourth, it's just just everything south of Fourth. So City View stays into Three. So south of Fourth is what he's saying. That's what I'm saying. South of Fourth stays yeah. in District I think you Two. Said it backwards. Oh, hold on. Say it again. Restate it. South of Fourth stays in District Two, which includes right. City View. No, and south and north of Fourth includes um, Regal Trace. Am I am I correct? North of Fourth, yeah, I think you're correct. Yeah, yeah, but why can't we go to Two Street? Because then you're cutting a neighborhood in half, right? No, we're not. We're cutting it in half anyway. <laughs> we're trying to draw a line, a little line, to Broward Boulevard and Seventh Avenue. Right, but I'm saying that historically, historically, the post office has been in my district. City View has been in District Two. No, it hasn't. It was the it was built in District Three initially. Right. But in 2003... 10 years ago, it changed. We, no, we lost no, it. 20 years ago. In 2000... I remember I was the okay. first commissioner. Okay. And it was Carlton but Moore... But look what we're arguing about again. We're arguing about black and white yeah. stuff. Carlton Moore and I had an exchange right here. I wasn't a commissioner. And now you and I have an exchange tonight, but listen to what I'm saying. But let me finish what I'm saying. Carlton Moore was sitting in your seat, and, and I was <laughs> sitting in the audience. I wasn't yet a commissioner. <clears throat> it was a debate on whether to include City View, and this was in 2002, and, and it was decided, let City View stay in District 2, and it, he didn't think there was anything historically connected to City View and District 3. And that's why it, it's been that way for 20 years. So he didn't think any the, 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 all that property is, is historic in City View. I'm Bob just, Young built City View. I'm just telling you, that's the historic. It's been 20 years, not 10 years. So, so what we're doing now is going to compromise. What, right now, I have the service from the service station. I right through the back of Eagle Trace, all the way down to Sistrum. I think what we're trying to do is be so we can make it contiguous. Be the least disruptive of existing. we can make yeah, but you're saying you're being least disruptive with, with 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 people. You're saying give the black people to me and give the white folks who live in City View to you all. That makes it contiguous. That's what you just said. No. Why can't we just go down Two Street? But hold on. No. If we go down Two Street, look at Two Street, up to the tracks, we still make it contiguous. So north, you're saying Northwest Second Street would be the southern boundary for you. Makes it contiguous to keep sailboat bend in play. Everybody's happy. And then the block from Northwest Second to Broward would be it accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. I'm not trying to call him, but I'm just saying don't just push two. it and give me that small quadrant. The whole, from Broward to six, to, to six was 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 the place. Okay, well, we're not deciding anything. I'm saying just as a thought for us to get a discussion. consensus later on. So this is just for discussion purposes. I mean, so so if we go down second, that that's a good compromise. It still keeps it contiguous because we have to we have to hit at Broward. Am I correct, Mayor? I think that we have to be as least disruptive as possible. But we, we, we look at Southwest. What I just took over there, the Riverland. That's a leaps and bound for my district. On option six. <clears throat> There's one. There's that one section that is included in your district. You're right. Two thousand one hundred eighty-two people, but everything else right. stays the it same. Works out. Yeah, is that, it stays the same. Is that making sense? What we're saying mm -hmm. um, to look at, but it gives you the continuity. I know. Can you do that? I, you're cutting out that piece. Does that make it everything else contiguous? Well, I'm going to need it some is. confirmation on exactly what geographic boundaries we're talking about. So, two street. Yeah. Sure, so man. the idea is right, that second. Okay, hold on. Move move that up a little bit just so we can see it. Yeah, so th that where you have that southern uh, pen line, I think, is Second Street, Northwest Second Street, right? Where you're drawing. Well, Second Street's right oh. here, north of the bus station. That's exactly what we're talking about. That's it. So yeah, so what, That's Commissioner crazy. McKenzie's the the idea is yes, that stays as um, district. No. I need to get an, an opinion, Mayor, from our city attorney and from FAU, because this to me now is 
Gerrymandering. What you, this is gerrymandering to its nth degree. Suggestion. So, and we're not supposed to do it, but I want to hear what you have to say, city attorney, and I want to hear what FAU has to say. But this, what we're, this exercise that we're engaged in right now is exactly what we're not supposed to be doing. That's all I'm going to say. Is that all you're going to say? That's, well, for now. <laughs> well, first, let me just address, because I conferred with, with counsel, I mean, with, with our, our, our consultant on it. If, I, if I'm looking at the geography right, if we make that, you can't have sailboat Ben hanging by a thread no. because that, that you lose complete compactness there and you, you have to have that. So even if it's technically contiguous, you're going to have to have enough of a connection. You can't be hanging by a thread. Um, generally, I will say that we are sort of adding a lot of parameters, and I'm not talking about just this discussion, but... To the commissioner's point earlier, it's supposed to be really at the core of it a numerical exercise with to be as objective and, and as possible. When we get into what civic associations want, what neighborhoods want, they don't want this commissioner, they don't want that commissioner, they want to be part of this <clears throat> neighborhood or so on. You get down into this rabbit hole where it becomes an impossible exercise. The core of it really is does come down from a legal standpoint, again, mathematical, understanding that there are parameters such as history, such as you know natural boundaries. Uh, you don't want to split HOAs or neighborhoods. Civic associations are different. Those are just voluntary groups. Um, the more variables you put in, the more difficult of an exercise this is for you. So again, numerically, we, that's the core of it. And then you have the other considerations. But again, when you look at your result and the more you get into the weeds, the more you can have the allegations that it is some form of gerrymandering or that you're sacrificing compactness or continuity for, let's say, having a neighborhood in one district versus the other. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Gamic Clark, do you want to respond? Certainly. As we've been indicating, the, the more that the commission tells us to put this neighborhood here, that neighborhood there, this neighborhood here, the less and less and less impartial, less and less independent the process becomes, the more and more it's going to be subject to potential criticism. We would strongly recommend that rather than trying to tweak the alternatives <coughs> that we presented, that you pick one of the alternatives that we presented. Given that the four new alternatives that we presented this evening, the fifth one that we were ready to present last week, all take into account a great deal of feedback from not only each of the commissioners, but also various members of the public. Uh, I think that would be your safest course of action. Okay. If that's the case, also, Mayor, then we may just want to, if we choose six, then I think we just choose six as is and not make any changes, even though there are two apartment or condo buildings. Well, it does divide a neighborhood, though. Right, we're trying not to divide any neighborhoods. All right, well, like I said, you want you. All right, so all right, so we we've I think we've aired it's it not, out. It's not dividing the neighborhood. It's taking the the business the business strip is going to go with Sailboat Bay, and the neighborhood stays in the neighborhood. When you look at neighborhoods, all it's right. all it's doing to, to keep that contiguous or con continuity you spoke about earlier. All right, so we've had a full discussion. We've heard from our consultant. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for your patience. My pleasure. And thank you for bringing to us not the two that we asked for, but for you finished, ben? multiple, uh, multiple uh, recommendations. Tonight we're going to vote on it, and we can think between now and tonight what choices. Man, we, we didn't hear from the vice mayor. Yeah, or the or the mayor. Oh, I didn't think we heard. From, we didn't hear from the vice mayor. No, we didn't. Oh. No, or the mayor. Or the he was mayor. just asking a question to try to yeah, appease me. Mayor. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, <laughs> Mayor? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah. So great work. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, the, the best path to go is just the least disruptive to the majority of, to all the commissions, I think the least disruptive. I think option six to me makes makes the most sense there. So thanks, Mayor. Oh, okay, great. <clears throat> I concur with the Vice Mayor. Um, I, I really feel that the, the reason why we were all had heartburn over the first set of maps is because of the total disruption of the, of the city and the neighborhoods and who is representing whom and all that. And... Uh, and like uh, Commissioner Glassman said, this is not personal to any one of us uh, or any one of you um, because, <clears throat> you know, at some point, you know, these districts will be represented by different people over the course of the next 10 years. And uh, 
Um, and so, uh, anyway, that my feeling is to uh, try to maintain the least disruptive nature as possible. Uh, and so, you know, option six seems to be the most appropriate. But again, we have between now and tonight to think about this and to be jawboned by some people from our neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, but hopefully I know we're going to make the right decision. So if how do, nothing... how do we get the most update or the updated map to actually vote on if we're leaning towards six? How do we get the update that puts Lake Ridge <clears throat> or makes them whole? Well, we can do it at the meeting. Can we? Yeah, we can. Well, that, that, We're not going to have a, a physical map, but <clears throat> suddenly say alternative six with this small tweak. We can say that. We can vote on that as amended. Well, it, I'll tell you what. Can you, could you do like a 6A? Yes. And, and then <clears throat> we either vote it up or down. Okay. We will do we 6A, but I, I'm not going to be able to have a chance to do it before 6 o'clock. <laughs> well, you know, it's not going to be at 6. It'll be like seven, seven thirty. So <laughs> six, I don't know. six ten, okay. six ten. Well, I, don't, I don't know that they can do it that way. Well. So good. Six, and if Commissioner McKenzie six. wants a, an eight A or a seven A. No, I think I think I think a six A will be fine if it puts my considerations just like we put in the Lake Ridge consideration in and we vote on it. So you put six, it in there, we vote on it. Or a six B or a six B. I don't think we need another B because the B I'll be in the same predicament. I think if you do an A with with changes or don't do any changes. I don't think they can generate a physical map for you. Well, I think if we do it in concept, we've always had first readings and we come back with the finished product later on. Okay. So if it, if A says Lake Ridge and that little bump to second, I think we accomplish our goals. Then we can vote on a map that okay. adds a little changes. Okay. In. All right. Not B, C, D, and E. Again, we're going to have to clarify at some point exactly what constitutes the bump. All right, so we can talk Second. about that. We can talk about that when someone makes a motion tonight. All right. Well, no, well, if, if he, he needs direction now as to the well, exact eight. geographical parameters that he needs to add to that option. Well, he just said he couldn't produce a map for tonight. So we can I understand, but for, for the sake of the record, we're going to need to know exactly, if we're adding two streets, we're going to need to know exactly what streets, what geographical boundaries, because they're going to need the direction to be able to go back and generate that map and the shape files and everything, all the underlying data that we're going to need to be able to transmit to the well, advisor Commissioner, election. Well, Commissioner McKenzie wanted one modification, exactly. so that would be 6A, and Commissioner uh, Glassman wanted a different modification, so that could be 6B. Alan is no, saying we need the exact geography. He needs <clears throat> So I can tell street. you right now what I can tell you right now what 6B is, which was including <clears throat> Uh, that section that's that's east of US one, okay. Rich, yeah, he probably knows Bring that time. back over to District uh, two. All right, that's and clear. then uh, Commissioner uh, uh, McKenzie <clears throat> wanted. Well, I don't know how you're going to do that because of the connectivity. So well, all, connectivity. Alan said we can't do what Commissioner McKenzie wants. Right. It's look, you can do what you want. It's just a create. If you have if you have sailboat Ben just hanging there by a thread, I, I think that's going to be not hanging by a thread. Well, about. You know, my suggestion is pre prepare the parameters. We voted up or down. That's all. That's all. I, I think okay. be, everyone deserves a chance to have their, but have I still, their choice voted. I up. agree with you, but I think it should be if it's going to be a change, it should be just the two changes, Both not changes. A and a B. Right. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, that's fine. But we'll I think it could on. be one change, and it could be another change, and or it could be both changes, or it could be no changes. <clears throat> that's maybe how there we are three maps. It could a, be B, any of those. A, B, and C. No, right. I think what the mayor said, the mayor <laughs> wants McKenzie's change. The mayor wants a 6A and B. So then you can have Add a 6C with both. That's not what the mayor said, but you seem, seem to be the mayor whisper. <laughs> whisper. A is your change, B is McKenzie, C is both. <laughs> All right. We so vote up and down each one. Does so so to Let's do an A. A with a change, we vote up or down. Hey, we win or lose. <laughs> okay. I think we're done. Okay, well, hold on. It, yeah, you're probably not clear. So, right. Right, yeah, so hold on, hold on. Okay. Okay. Street up to. Just take the business district. That's that's enough not 14th, to make 14th. So, if you're, already, if you're talking about the Federal Highway so, section, that goes up to 14th Court, which includes mm -hmm. Riva. Not Federal Highway. Up to 14th. Excuse me. What? Yeah. That, whatever that little piece you took out to put into District 1. On map six, yes. just put it back into district two. Okay. 
you know the piece. That's fine, but I, I thought he was also asking to go. No, right. he, I, would, right. I would recommend that after the meeting, if you could, if you could talk with Commissioner McKenzie, he can describe it to you. Right. But that so will just, be that will be a separate map. No, it will be well, just changes. If we're going to change, just, I, have a, just have a change map and a real map. No, I don't want to necessarily I split don't want the to neighborhood. What you're saying. I don't want to split the neighborhood. Not accepting your friendly amendment. I'm getting text I, messages from Progresso and people in the area where you want to take into District 3 now so, saying they no, no, want no, to stay. No, we're not taking that portion. I understand. We're not taking the, the, that side. I'm also hearing from Regal Trace. I'm, I'm getting Texas too. I, I'm hearing from Regal Trace. They're not public. Well, if someone wants to see I'm it, I'm hearing from the owners. I, I got care. a Progresso owner in the back of the room okay. that owns major property that wants to be in my district. So, I, Mayor, here, here's a suggestion. Here's a suggestion. Mayor, tell us. Um, so, here's a suggestion. I think we come forward with three maps okay, tonight. Okay. The first is option six as it stands printed. Second, Possibility is option six with this adjustment that Commissioner Glassman is asking for, which is the northern piece, right? Okay. The third, it's going to be four then. It's going to be th the third possibility is option six with this adjustment that Commissioner McKenzie's mentioned. The fourth is both of the option six with both adjustments. Yes. Is that clear? Makes yes. sense? Fantastic. That's what, that's what Commissioner Moritis was well, saying. Uh, yeah, I did say that, but since McKenzie... Great. I just want to clarify. ...approves Steve's, then maybe we just need two options. One is just Steve's, and one's Steve's and McKenzie's, because that's really what we're doing. We're not going to vote on McKenzie's without Steve's, so we really only need two. Steve's or Steve and McKenzie's. You see, see what I'm saying? No, we're no, not, think, we're not going to vote on just right. Roberts, because we all said we want... Lake Ridge to be correct. But I also want to see the numbers because right now, yeah. map six already has District 2 really low. So now you want to take more away from District 2. That, so that's your argument? I want to, no, it's that's not my argument, really. It, it's not my whole argument. It's I have a lot of it. arguments. Is that your argument, really? It's not my argument. Come on, Steve, look at you better than I got that. a lot of I'd arguments. You look me in my eyes and tell me the truth. You it's don't not want my black only people argument. Over there and, oh, and, and, say not, it. That say is, it. That is so offensive. Say it. That is so it's offensive what Progresso is doing to me. Where you going now, that is so offensive. Well, I went there. You went there with the numbers. Because guess what? I wouldn't be 1,000 over when I came in the game 4,000 under. Mayor, I am not going to sit here and listen to someone tell me that I don't want black people in my district. I'm not listening to someone tell me that Progresso don't want black people in my district. Mayor, that is, you said that is, that is you obnoxious. Said it. You, right. said it. you said it. Obnoxious. You said it. I think we've got, I think you've got right. the plan. Thank you very much. We'll see you tonight. Mary, Thank Mary, you. Just to add something. Clap. We will not be able to give you the Correct. by tonight. Yes. Okay. Oh, Mary, did you want to add something? Thank you. I just want to point out that the Civic Association, the Fort Lauderdale um, Association of Civic Associations has asked that we keep civic associations together. Commissioner Glassman is trying to put a civic association together. Commissioner McKenzie is taking one all apart. And I know that there's different parts of Progresso, there's residential, there's warehouse, but that's one civic association and I, I just want to point out that that's not the direction that 50 civic associations that are part of the uh, Fort Lauderdale Civic Associations don't want to see. I just want to point that out. Okay. So, and, and you, you. want to keep you want to keep the mall in play, right? Because the development is going on. You want to be a part of that from Coral I Ridge, right? Correct. Keep that all the way it is. And it's the not changing anything. and the city attorney said to us that you can't do that. Civic associations. No, you just let them do it. Civic associations aren't in play, but civic associations have dictated and led this whole discussion. If you look at this map, put the, can you put a map up, anyone? Well, I'm not Assaulted. talking about, I'm not talking for myself. I'm talking for 50 Can we put a map up right quick? Any map, pick one. Just put one up on the screen. Can, while he's doing that, is uh, Regal Trace is in District 2 now? Yes. Yeah, I got thirty. I got the three back apartments. I have some of them. No, but I'm saying, you're saying that I have the races because he doesn't want black people in his no, district, no, but, but he wants but, to keep Regal Right. I have listen. I have I have three of the builders in my in my district, three of the builders and the plaza. It goes away in six. I lose the plaza in six. I lose the mail. I lose uh, the post office. I lose the the kindergarten. All the stuff that we built, I lose in this in in, in six because you push me back to the west side of Seventh Avenue. I'm talking about a historical there's piece. No populations in the po in the post office. There's no. But that's a, we're, we're still losing something that we fought for, uh, Mayor. 
right. That's all I'm saying. All right. We got I got 36 residents in Riga Trace in those three apartments. All right. They run along the power line. 36 of my people I'm gonna lose. I think it's all right. 34. All right. The consultant told me 36. Are we done? No, can you put the map up for a second? Oh, he's got that's six. Can you want seven? Matter. I don't care what map it is. Okay, I just want to. I want to understand something. Okay. When we talk about the vision of dividing neighborhoods, right? If you look at any district, any district, and how we separate our lines, it's going right through neighborhoods. It's going right through neighborhoods. But what we're saying not to divide is civic associations. What neighborhoods are being divided? Look, if you look at the, look, they go through neighborhoods. Like even where you put me out here in the south, southwest, it's a, it's a neighborhood. See those lines? Those are neighborhoods. All these people could be neighbors with one big square. All these people people could be neighbors with one big square. But they these are neighborhoods. I know, but they currently are 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 but you, divided you, according to the existing you, neighborhood association. You gave me boundaries. you gave me some folks over here that aren't part of Sunset Civic. Okay. Two thousand and one hundred and something of them to be exact. So. The words is what I'm, I'm I'm talking about. We divided neighborhoods to do what? District maps. Right. Everybody looks confused, don't you? Because mm -hmm. you got what you want. So you're not confused. All right. I think we need two maps tonight, but we're not going to get that. But I think you need to consider this portion being put back into District 3. That's all, right. all I'm asking. We'll vote on that tonight. All right. Thank you, everyone, for speaking here. Thank you, folks, for uh, um, providing these new maps to us, and we'll make that decision tonight. Thank you again. Thank I you. appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to commission reports. Um, Commissioner Moritis, do you have anything to report? You know what? Be well, no. C go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to do the CRA meeting, but yeah. but, th but that I have to cut CRA into another first? meeting. Let's finish with the conference meeting, and then we'll go in the CRA. For the go ahead, Commissioner. You know what? I'm good for now. Let's You're good? All right. Commissioner McKenzie? Okay. No, I don't have a report. Commissioner Glassman? Yes. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah. Wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Moritis uh, for the Broward League of Cities lunch hosting. That was uh, really nice on Thursday, April 7th. Um, and uh, also on that day, we had the Made to Move Painted Intersections in Lake Ridge public event. Um, on the 12th, uh, Ishoff Swimming Hall of Fame board meeting. Things are moving along really quickly there. And I also wanted to thank Fire Rescue for coordinating the Mobile Integrated Healthcare Community Needs Assessment that day. Um, Solid Waste Working Group continues to work, and we're going to hopefully have a scheduled presentation here at our commission in May. Um, also, that night, I attended the first uh, session of the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. It's always great to see that group. Um, they have a really nice size group, so um, kudos to staff and neighborhood support. Um, that's a great, great program. Um, on uh, Upcoming up, we have the uh, Brito statue unveiling tomorrow, I think, by... Uh, we have the what? The Brito, Brito unveiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Romero Brito uh, statue unveiling. It's going to be exciting to have that piece of art in our city. Also tomorrow night is the That's Poinsettia Heights. That's excuse me? One That's at 1 o'clock, yes. And then tomorrow evening is a Poinsettia Heights Civic Association. It looks like I'll be saying goodbye tomorrow night to the Poinsettia Heights Civic Association uh, when I attend that meeting. So uh, timing is everything, I guess. Um, this, <laughs> geez, this it's Thursday. Not your, it's not your association tomorrow. Excuse me? If we vote on it tonight, it's not your association tomorrow. Well, I'll yes, still go and say good. It is when, for two. Yeah. When, why? When does it take effect? Once we eat the second tonight, vote. Tonight? Tonight? Does it take effect? No. no. Alan's no. Alan's saying no. Oh. When does it take effect, Alan? Second vote. Second reading. Second reading. Oh. Okay. You so. can you can sing your swan song. Tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> still have two more weeks. Uh, Thursday, we have very exciting five-star hotel uh, groundbreaking on Las Solas, uh, 10 a.m. And then also, congratulations. Is Wendy here right now? She's got her retirement party uh, on Thursday as well. She uh, she vacationed out the last two weeks, but she's coming back on Thursday. For just for the party? For just for the okay, party. Okay, that's great. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, congratulations, Wendy. Uh, how many years has Wendy been in the city? Just over 13 years. Wow. 
Good for her. Um, and thank you for all of your service as well. Um, Saturday, we have Employee City Family Fun Day. Um, and then next week, we've got the first anniversary of Cuba Libre. We also have the Central Beach Alliance meeting that same Thursday. And then I can't even believe it's a year, but Saturday, April 30th and May 1st, the Fort Lauderdale Air Show is, uh, we're up and running again. That's about it for me, man. You get Cuba Libre? Cuba Libre has the first anniversary uh, they were open? ceremony, party, whatever, okay. gathering. The first anniversary. One year already. Amazing. Wait. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And, um, and Mayor, I have one thing, too, that I found my notes. Sorry. <coughs> Before we go on to the next one, when Steve's done. I am finished. Thank you. Okay. okay. Can I talk again? You it's can, not up wait to till, me. Wait till the vice mayor speaks, and then we'll go back to you. Okay. Thank you. Can I yield my time to the former vice mayor, <laughs> the vice yeah. mayor emeritus? Very nice. Okay. So I found my notes. So Fred had a great idea. And since he's here, I want to make sure I bring this up. Fred who? Fred Nesbitt. Who is Fred. sitting right here, the president of the Gallup Association. So we have our regular parks board, but we were wondering and discussing, is it possible to have a more informal advisory board, Phil, or commission, um, whose role would be to maybe advise the individual parks? Like there would be the Beach Community Center Advisory Board, and then that would be made up just by a few neighbors or maybe the businesses in the area, and they would just touch base with the director at that center. Um, so each community center, I guess, or I don't know, we'd have to decide, is it a community center, or is it a park, which whatever we decide to do, is it possible to have some informal advisory boards made up of our neighbors, you know, who kind of check in and see what our programming opportunities are with our individual community centers? Or I don't know, Alan? Not, is not, not formally related to the city. I mean, obviously, volunteer groups, they could. But the only advisory boards or committees that are permitted are those that answer to the city commission. Those are the only so ones to have one for every park or every community, I mean, they could voluntarily get together and, and talk to Phil or talk to someone, but not sanctioned or created were they formally by the city? Is it is a commissioner allowed to maybe take that on unofficially and kind of meet with some neighbors and, and get ideas? You can meet right with neighbors and, and have ideas, but to formalize some sort of committee, even though we're going to call it informal, um, to just answer to one commissioner? That, that, would be good. that wouldn't be. Okay, so we can't have an official group, but it's okay as, if we as a commissioner were to talk to a group of neighbors and get some ideas and then how do we bring them back because I can't tell Phil what to do. You don't bring them back. You'd, nope. have, you'd have to bring it back to the city commission or to the city manager depending on the level of, of well, if it's a policy issue, obviously you'd bring it back to the city commission. If it's an operational issue, you could go to the city manager and say, hey, there's an operational issue at this park, then the city manager could deal with it. Okay. Well, I did have, Phil and I have worked together on some different parks before, and he, I've always made sure he's been at the meetings when we've talked about maybe the Beach Community Center Park. Are we allowed to kind of keep doing something like that informally once or twice? You can as long as the director is not getting any sort of direction from okay. your office. Yeah. So the director meaning Phil. Mm -hmm. So as long as we're not telling Phil what to do, but it's kind of advisory in nature. And then, um, okay, so it can't be formal. All right, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. All right. Did you have anything else to add, mm -hmm. uh, Vice Mayor? Oh, I didn't even yeah, didn't start. start yet. I just <laughs> said you, d you deferred to Commissioner Marais. Yeah, I gave her time. Yeah, I want to give her. So I won't take too much time, Mayor. Oh, no, no, I'll go be ahead. brief. If you had anything more you I'll be to brief. Add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Greg, where, and, and maybe. Chris will have the better update when he comes back. But uh, Las Olas, the financial analysis, Stantec, wh where are we on that? Ben Rogers next? has some update on that. Uh, he's Great. working on getting um, analysis done and can share more on that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this, is on the re this is on the redesign of Las Olas. Exactly, the redesign of Las Olas. Yep. If you can just give us an update. Thanks, Ben. Okay, good afternoon. Ben Rogers, Transportation Mobility. Um, so I actually talked with Stantec earlier today. They're formalizing their memo. Uh, they're going to have a draft report to us hopefully in the next week or two. They were planning to have it done last week, but then they came up with some different concepts based off of some input that we received. So hopefully in the next two or three weeks we'll have that memo, and then we'll just we meet the city manager and just uh, determine the next steps. 
Okay, great. So hopefully we'll get that memo next week. Is that what you said? Sometime in the next two or three weeks. Okay, great. Um, next topic, federal courthouse. You and I were on this call with AT&T and GSA and so forth. How, what, give us the update. We're just, Mayor, we're working on um, AT&T and easements and trying to get everyone just working together to, to solve. Yeah, there were some site conflicts with the uh, vacation of one of the roadways where AT&T has a major utility line. So they're working with GSA to relocate that utility around the perimeter of the site, yep. which then will allow us to vacate the roadway and uh, they can advance with their current site plan. Okay, great. I was hearing feedback that the letter they got from AT&T wasn't exactly what GSA wanted. Have you heard any more feedback about that or is that, do you think? I believe the ball is in AT&T's court at this point. I think yeah. the confusion was there some conflicts that are in the right of way and there's some conflicts that are on uh, GSA's private parcel okay and that they wanted GSA was looking for clarification on uh, differing between the two okay all right great thanks Ben um, I think that's it uh, you Ben um, Greg noise ordinance the noise ordinance task force I haven't heard much recently how yeah Alan or how what's what's the oh, latest yeah. there so go ahead. so um, the noise ordinance um, committee yeah uh, they um, they uh, uh, decided to not meet until we uh, received some uh, the solicitations back from the on RFP that we put out um, but we do have a meeting next week and um, uh, one of the things that we wanted to um, do is just uh, follow their the topics that they've chosen to, to speak about so next week we'll be speaking about um, any of the results that we received from the RFP I don't believe we received any, but we, I think we put them out again. Uh, there was a. Uh, is this for the consultant? To, to get a consultant. Latest. Okay. Right. And then there's going to be also discussion about how uh, police handles matters and also um, how special events are uh, funneled through the process to understand the noise impact for uh, events that take place. Okay. All right. That, that sounds fine. Um, let's see. Greg, could I get. Um, I have some public works related questions. Um, just want to get an update on Mayor. I know you know where uh, Edgewood stormwater um, systems, you know, full speed ahead and, and River Oaks. Maybe just a quick update, Greg from. Alan can come and assist with that. Just quick update on that. And then um, where we are with Tarpon River dredging. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Alan Dodd, Public Works Director. Uh, both of the stormwater projects are ahead of schedule. Great. And we just speaking to the mic there a little bit more, Alan. Just yeah. uh, both projects are ahead of schedule. We anticipate uh, Edgewood will be done uh, probably close to a year ahead of schedule. Uh, awesome. The other one is uh, a little bit further behind, but still we're looking around six months ahead of schedule for completion. Everything is going very smoothly so far. That's awesome. And Tarpon River dredging. I'd ask if Dr. Gassman has... Okay, one. great. Just kind of... Thanks, Dr. Gassman. Just looking, just a little update when that starts, how that's looking. Thanks. Nancy Gassman, Public Works. Uh, we have been able to issue the notice to proceed. The vendor is on site. Uh, they have run into some site concerns where we're working with various uh, property owners to move their boats because we don't have enough access okay. to be able to move the barge from the dredging location to its operating location. Okay. So currently we think we're about a week delayed, okay. but we are working closely with various property owners to try to resolve those conflicts within the navigable waterway. Okay, great. So like starting in a couple weeks, is that what you're... Yeah, they they should be full getting fully mobilized in the next few, two weeks. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, last topic, Mayor. Well, I, a couple more, but um, tree ordinance. So I've been working. If you remember, we brought forward some initial possibilities for the tree landscape ordinance. Um, neighbors wanted us to work a little bit more on that. So, Mayor, I've been doing that with the neighbors. We had a great first meeting where we maybe accomplish uh, great success in getting alignment. We have one more meeting with me and, and, and you know, whoever wants to attend, but a lot of, lot of neighbors, good discussions. So, so I think we're going to get to a really good place and be able to bring that back to the commission here soon. So I just really appreciate the neighbors and staff working on that. And then lastly, Mayor, is just uh, now the um, 
air show coming up, but we got Fleet Week coming up, which starts Sunday, May 1st, I think is the first day for Fleet Week. Um, so just excited for our, our, our sailors to be in town. Um, is that the whole week then? It's the whole week, yeah. So it starts the first, I don't know what day it actually ends, maybe the 6th, but it, it's that whole first week of May. Okay. Um, so I'll make sure we're just kind of, everyone's getting info on events. And right, so, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything. You have an, okay, I'll get, I'll get, make sure we get that. To, is it an official ceremony or anything? So I don't know what specific official things are going to be happening. I don't know, Greg, if anyone now. I'll, I'm going to ask Ashley if she has any knowledge. I think we met them at the park one year. I think in the past, Dean, we come to the ship. Yeah, we would kick off. Yeah, we did. We've had some kickoffs. The clubs had some stuff. Um, I don't have any details about specific events, but it's on your master calendar that we provided. It's the 1st through the 8th, and I'll update that um, with e events as we get more details. That's a good point. Where do we access the master calendar? I'll send you a link. Okay. I'll send you. And I'll reach out to the chair of Fleet Week and get um, – yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner. Why don't you do, like, um, whatever the first day is, see if we can coordinate something where we all come out. Yep. Bless it, and then yeah, we pick that's a good idea. Give us as we go. Monday? I think it's the first, though. That's the air show on Sunday. That Monday night? I think the plan is for Sunday for us to have something like what you're both talking about. Okay. Why don't we get the specifics? I'll, I'll work on it. But that is the air show, too. Yeah. Right. It overlaps one day. Yeah. And that was intentional. What to, type of boat is in the port? Is it an aircraft so I, carrier? I think it's, no, I think it's going to be a destroyer. Uh, Usually they EDG. do something aboard the ship, too, that we're invited to. So that would be. I'll work it. Yeah, I'll work it. And 10th Annual Color Run, April 30th, coming up. Mayor, that's all I've got. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hey, Mayor, could, <clears throat> Mayor, real quick. Right here. Yes, go ahead. We were talking about dredging, right? What, whatever happened to the waterway cleanups we were doing? Did we put that on hold? Which which waterway? Well, we started over here. Uh, on Tarpon, Tarpon yeah. River. Yeah, that's what you started. Are they going to continue? Because I was anticipating. I think that's Where are we with that? Right? Just no, he was dredging. talking about dredging, but it reminded yeah. me of the waterway cleanup. Yeah, so what I was talking about is the due to the sewage impact on the Tarpon River, they're going to be dredging about 800 feet of that due to the sewage impact. That's what I was Different. talking about. I'm going back to you about another cleanup? the waterway cleanup where we kicked off you and I down there. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I, I think I it was supposed to go to diff all the different... I don't know. Uh, where are we with that? Are you talking Nancy, about do that? you know anything about this? No? Okay. You know about it. You were there with me. I remember, but I thought it had already happened. Yeah, they did the one piece. I thought we were going to continue cleaning up our waterways. Right, but I thought that event already happened. In that one area? Water channel. But what about the... You're talking about the sampling of the waters? What, no. what, you what do you I think the it was the project the in, in Hiroshima where we were actually using that new... We are testing that new technology. Right. Oh, that. For, that oh, yeah. protein skimming. Okay. Talking about protein, protein skimming. skimming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know yep. where are we with three. We just we've we sort abandoned of it on hold, right? We we have ended ended our our pilot uh, and spent the available funds to complete the pilot. Um, when we gave you the waterway quality mm -hmm. update, um, there was some additional discussion from the vendor about expanding their area, but sta the staff report at the time was that while the pilot was interesting, it did not end up providing the level of cleanup that was expected I, th I think what I think what uh, dr. Gassman is saying because uh, I read her report and it was that while the the methodology was uh, what has promise uh, she felt that considering the amount of money it took to get to that point it would be better to try to spend that money to pay people to monitor the um, the outfall of the adjacent property owners and to try to regulate the uh, the outfall that that was contaminating the Hammersy Canal rather than just trying to continue to pump through and oxidize oxidate the the the, uh, the the water because it continues to get uh, polluted by the adjacent property owners. It's like there's no end to it. So I think we're at a standstill right now, and we probably need to have a discussion regarding that. Did yeah, I summarize? The, the, the technology right. is designed to work in closed systems. Right. And a tidal water way that leads to the ocean is not a closed system. And right. so 
for every for every gallon of water that is processed through this equipment, mm -hmm. there's another gallon of water that's either coming in from the ocean or coming in through the stormwater system that is pushing out that cleaned water and you're starting all over again. <clears throat> she said, it, yeah, I remember that. I remember your-, your I, I just didn't, didn't know where we- We haven't we picked, and, and that's where it ended, right there. We have not picked up on that okay. yet. So we can probably talk. We yeah, I'd like to keep that discussion going. Options and yeah, just we should have that as an agenda. Yeah, on conference okay. meeting, we got, yeah. Uh, some future conference yeah. meeting. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right. It was a uh, pilot, and um, we can bring back more information. Bring, let's bring that back at some future meeting where we have a slow conference meeting. All right, thanks. Uh, and we can uh, talk about it. <clears throat> All right. All right. So um, just a few things. Uh, uh, attending a lot of events these last couple of weeks, the abandoned pet rescue reception with uh, uh, over on the beach. Uh, also, I welcomed uh, the CODA Summit. This was a, an event with the Art Museum uh, where it brings together artists and people who pay, commission, pay to have commissions accomplished uh, through, through these artists. And it's uh, just part of a beginning program that our art museum is, is starting to be, uh, become part of. It's a national program. Um, let's see, uh, the Mercedes-Benz corporate run took place this year, which was really, really great. Uh, unfortunately, the numbers have diminished, but hopefully now that it's post-COVID, we can probably get more people. On April 9th, I participated in the Mayor's Chess Challenge, and uh, to my chagrin, I was beaten by a 12 and an 11-year-old. Well, you predicted uh. that. <laughs> you said it before you left here. Wow. I hope the lighting was good, though. The lighting was good. Good. Uh, yeah. Blinding, but it was good. Uh, anyway, um, I attended the Imperial Point Spring Fling, which was uh, very well attended, and I judged the hula hoop con contest. Cool. And, hula hoop? And, yes, and I gave out the prizes. Um, and uh, I, also, I also was asked to participate in the swearing-in ceremony of our new Senator, Rosalind Osgood. Congratulations, Rosalind. Of course, she's coming up for re-election this November, so... Uh, uh, Best of uh, luck to her. Uh, and uh, for those of the Greek Orthodox faith or the Eastern Orthodox Christian faith, it, this weekend is Easter weekend, so I wish you all a happy Easter. And for those who are Jewish, the continuation of Passover, please make sure you light your menorahs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, I'm very excited that uh, Romero Brito is going to be in our neighborhood uh, uh, dedicating a new statue um, that has uh, that he created that was commissioned by a private uh, party and it's going to be uh, installed at Hardy Park at 1 p.m. on April 20th so I'm very excited about that April 20th being tomorrow um, you mentioned the groundbreaking of the new hotel that's going to take place on Las Olas Boulevard and uh, we have uh, Snyder Park is the, going to be, again, the location for a city employee picnic. I will be there at 11 o'clock serving beer. So I um, hope to see many of you there. Um, let's see. Um, Mayor, we forgot the color run. April 30th, the 10th anniversary of the color run. Yes. Well, I think, uh, the, I think the vice mayor. Did the vice mayor say the color run? I announced yes, it, I but you yeah. Okay, I'm glad you. you were paying attention. <laughs> no problem. Right? Yeah. A second time is great. Yes. Thank you. Just but also make... on April 30th is Fort Lauderdale Cares Day, yes. and uh, I hope to see as many volunteers as possible. Thank you, George Hushka, for again uh, leading this uh, effort uh, and all the great work that you continue to do in our uh, for our city and our community. So again, that's April 30th. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, please call City Hall. We'll be happy to direct you. Um, and again, the air show, along with Fleet Week, it's a great uh, signature event for our city, and hopefully the weather's great. And uh, a couple things I want to discuss. Uh, we've been approached by some Ukrainian individuals who are asking if there's any equipment that we could send over to, the U to Ukraine, like bulletproof vests, helmets, first aid supplies. Um, while we do have... Um, uh, we do have such items, and they would all go through the Ukrainian consulate. Um, I don't know whether the city commission wants to commit that. It's going to be an expense to the city because we will have to replace them. Is there any interest in, in on this commission to try to help with the war effort? Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, Greg, can you uh, put together some kind of uh, uh, appropriate, uh, I don't know, uh, assemblage? 
we can follow up. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, they, they want bulletproof vests? They want bulletproof vests for obvious reasons. Uh, helmets, first aid supplies, any, any medical equipment, uh, and any volunteers who want to go over there. <laughs> any volunteers? <laughs> oh, goodness. We'll get that communication from you and yeah. follow up with the team. All right, thank you. I speak with uh, Scott Wyman because I think he got the, uh, the request. Got it. Okay, so I wanted to I'll let everybody know that um, uh, I've been speaking with our folks over at the county uh, as we just continue to discuss the issue concerning the joint government campus. Um, my understanding is, uh, first of all, I have a timeline here of where think what we've been doing now we have been talking about this thing for about five years first of all very informally uh, even before i was mayor i was uh, the then commission appointed me to represent the city to start preliminary discussions with regard to the feasibility of the joint government uh, building but since then this commission has met we met on june 18th 2019 october 15th 2019 we had multiple meetings but the last meeting we had was on june 10th of last year now you say june 10th it's almost a year ago we met and and what has happened we were supposed to have an rfp issued in august of last year nothing has happened i've i personally and maybe each of you have repeatedly asked for questions to be answered let's have another meeting tell us what's going on where are things going I do know that they have been meeting with various vendors and contractors and and uh, what concerns me is that the price of this building keeps going up uh, the delay in accomplishing the building keeps uh, keeps going up um, so I'm told now uh, during this meeting I was told that I believe um, May 5th they're having a workshop on their own to decide, you know, where they where they stand. It'd be nice if we had a workshop with them, but I guess they don't see us as the partners that I thought we were. But nonetheless, um, uh, it's becoming difficult for me to think that this partnership is uh, is holding together. Uh, and my concern is, like you, you, the concerns you all have shared before about the cost of this and the amount of time it's going to take to accomplish. So, um, I guess we should we could wait until uh, they have their workshop. But I, I, you know, we should always be thinking about a plan B, and uh, uh, in case this doesn't work out for us. So, um, if you have any thoughts, you know, I'd be happy to to hear them. But I'm just letting you know that it really concerns me that so many months have passed. And despite repeated efforts to get information out of them, we just don't seem to be getting anywhere. So that's the update. Do you have any, que you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, I, st I still am I'm hoping that we can work together on this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to some of them um, just to kind of check in. And I, do we have any sense what they're talking about at their meeting, what the agenda is, Mayor, at that meeting? They don't tell us anything. Don't tell, we don't. Yeah, we don't know. I did meet with Monica Superco. The uh, yeah, sure. The new I met with her. Yep. I met with. Uh, what would she have to say? Mike, Mike, Mike Udeen. Yep. I met with, and I was there, and the city manager attended this meeting. There was like okay. four of us, uh, and um, we asked all these questions. Yeah. Like, what's taking so long? Why? Right. Why haven't the R? Why doesn't has the RFP gone out? Uh, Monica said the RFP should go out within the next 60 days. Um, again, uh, I don't understand why the delay. There was no explanation for the delay. Um, uh, they have issues regarding remediation of the site because right. there's contamination. Uh, and then there's the, uh, th there are a number of timelines that, that they have set out, which they have not shared with us. Um, and so, you know, you can certainly attend that workshop as a as a member of the audience, and uh, but whatever happens at that workshop, I think is going to be pivotal as to the direction that I think the city is going to take. So, um, you know, my big concern has always been the cost and the delay in how long it's going to take because we heard anecdotally that it may take as many as ten to twelve years before we see completion of the project, which is crazy. On top of the five we've already waited, so. Um, uh, so again, you know, uh, I'm, my, my, I'm open-minded to this process. Uh, 
you know, I thought it was a good idea at the beginning, but if it's if if we're not being included in the decision making process and we're not uh, uh, participating in in um, the approach going forward, if uh, if this becomes an expense that we may or may not be able to afford, uh, you know, we need to make these make some sort of decision soon, sooner than later. And when is it? When is their meeting, Mayor? Say it again. It's probably at their county building. No, uh, sorry. When? when? I believe I believe I said um, May fifth. May fifth, right? May fifth, Thursday, May fifth. Yeah, I think that's what I was told. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mayor. I think some of the county commissioners called for that meeting when they were surprised to hear some of the other county commissioners bring the topic up and some of the things that were said and then the quotes in the newspaper. Yeah. I think they were kind of taken aback by it and they want to okay. make sure they have a conversation with all of them, not just a couple of them sounding off and being oh. very negative. Okay. Good. Okay. That's the reason why they called it. Okay. That's, and that was the reason for my wanting to meet with them, too, because we were hearing from Senator Geller and we were hearing from... Uh, Bogan. Bogan, uh, uh, Commissioner Bogan, uh, that they both um, um, had no interest in, in proceeding with this, uh, partly because of the cost. Um, but yep. um, In addition to moving their campus to uh, out west... Well, not, I mean, they, have a, they have a different idea. They want we we our our goal was to consolidate all of our operations right, right. under one roof. Right. They they want their back office stuff to to stay out in just in various areas like the like the administration uh, stay downtown, but the but the, the, what they call the back office stuff to go out stay in plantation. The supervisor of election goes to some other city. The uh, the, um, it's an the uptown supervisor of election. State. What's that? I said that will be an uptown supervisor of election, and the other one will be right the, next. The property appraiser. Property appraiser. Is that where they want to locate them? They are locating their uptown. Okay. One. So already they're they're dispersing their operations throughout the county. Maybe they're going there. <laughs> well, you got to remember, <laughs> supervisor of election them. and the other is a constitutional officers. Right. So they shouldn't be there in the first place. That's just something they they rented years from them so it's not, they're not on the county's auspices. okay you're right well and that includes the sheriff too yes but sheriff has his own place sheriff because of the own. last sheriff to put his name on it right you know built the building so um uh <laughs> i mean he did yeah navarro <laughs> built it in, the, in honor of uh, the other guy that he took his name off and put tony's name up right. there so okay so i just wanted to give you all an update about that and uh and that's it. Okay. Anything else? We move into our CRA meeting. We have a shade. Are we gonna um? Shade. There's yeah, a CRA have, and a shade. Do you have anything you wanted to? You have a. You have no, a. No, no. Just the shade and the CRA. Yeah, just the CRA, right? What'd you and say? And shade. We have a shade meeting. Right? Oh, a shade. You, you guys scheduled it, so I'm just reminding. Can you. Can we do the shade meeting after tonight's meeting? Well, I have a court reporter that's been sitting here since four o'clock, so we should do it after CRA because we don't want to empty the whole room. <laughs> when? Can we do it upstairs while we're eating? After the CRA. On the eighth floor. All right, let's do the CRA meet. Let's say conference meeting is now concluded. Uh, let's begin the CRA meeting. Would you please call the roll? Commissioner Moretis? Here. Commissioner Glassman? Here. Commissioner McKenzie? Here. Vice Chair Sorensen? Here. Chair Trentales? Here. Um, so we have one item on the agenda. This is uh, R1 resolution waiving the minimum requirement for reimbursement of eligible project costs and the minimum contribution amount of the business property owner for the development incentive program and the motion approving the award of 727,000 to Dale's Wheels and Tires Direct Inc and authorizing the executive director to negotiate and execute the development agreements and any and all other documents or instruments necessary or incidental to consummate the transaction. Um, does anyone have any comments? I have a comment on this. Does anyone else have a comment on this? All right, let me just say this. Um, I know Dale, and he's a great guy. He's invested a lot in our community. Um, and uh, he's, you know, fixed a few of my wheels <laughs> uh, on cars of mine. Um, but the, and Dale's not poor. And I think while he does qualify for these programs, he's now asking us to provide um, incentives that exceed what the program allows for. So he's basically asking us to waive the, the the parameters that are normally associated with this program. You know, I want to see this, these buildings being built or renovated, and I think they will nonetheless. But 
with limited funds in the CRA and how important it is for us to try to s spread this remaining money to as many different incentive programs as possible. I, I'm just saying, I'm not going to say I'm going to vote against this, but I really, I just have this feeling like this is like 80% of the project and he's asking us to fund it. Now, again, Dale's a great guy. He's a great um, uh, a member of our business and residential community. I, I appreciate all that he's done to clean up that area of the street, in fact. He employs a lot of people. I'm not sure how many new people are going to be employed with this new addition because my understanding is that the that the purpose of the money is to create a storage facility and as well as customer lounge and showroom. So um, uh, I don't think it's going to add jobs. So Clarence, you want you have any sh share some thoughts on this? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. Uh, the reason we're asking for a waiver is because. Um, Dale has two parcels. If we were to just uh, use our property business improvement program along with the facade program, we would have two, actually four agreements, um, which he, we wouldn't be asking for a waiver. So he actually qualifies uh, for the property business improvement program for both parcels. So instead of having four agreements, what we decided was just to ask for, um, you know, a waiver of the um, uh, DIP program, which would allow just one agreement, one agreement. Well, how do we know all that money is going to be spent on all the properties? Oh, we, I mean, we basically are project managers for the property. I know, but he's not required. If we waive the, if we waive the minimum, Okay, he only has to spend this money on that one project. It's it's a consolidation of uh, the two parcels. The project is a consolidation of two parcels. The project is, mm -hmm. but the allocation is not. No, it will be. It it's, will be. It, yes, mm -hmm. all all one project. It'll it'll all be one project. And 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 basically, what this is, Commissioner, if you recall, um, back when back a couple of years ago. Uh, when Commissioner McKenzie asked that we look at the uh, DIP program because, you know, we have these that this massive difference between our PBI program, PBIP program and then the DIP program where we have requests that fall in between, um, we brought it to you to make the changes so we wouldn't have to keep coming and asking for uh, waivers, but you, you, the board decided not to go forward with the changes that we were making. Uh, but this falls, again, right in that, that, that middle area, uh, which we did for Cis Drunk Market, as well as um, um, the awning, what's the awning place? Hoover. Hoover awning, you know. Um, again, this is this, this issue with projects that are more than $225,000 for PBIP uh, that falls in between um, 225 and then you add the 125 for the uh, facade program, uh -huh. which is a total of 350000 So uh, in order to fund projects that are more than $350,000, we have to ask for wa waivers. Right. So the total project cost is about a million dollars. Yeah. Is that all the buildings? That's for both buildings. All right. And we're funding 75% of that. 75%, which would be right within the program limit under the PBIP program. Okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I just find it, you know, I, I mean, I think it's great that, you know, he's improving the area and he's, you know, he does employ a lot of people. I don't see how this is going to add to that, but. Well, someone wants to make a motion. How, how it'll add to it is that uh, there is a vacant and blighted building uh, that's to just to the east of where he is. So once he renovates that, he'll then be able to uh, rent that out. That well, he says it's going to be a customer lounge. He's not renting it out. No, there, there, there's there's two different there's two different um, there's two different uh, uh, parcels. Come to the mic. It's it's a it's it when we come to the microphone. Yeah, and put the rendering up. If you have the rendering, 
No, I've seen. I saw the rendering. Got it. So the the new storefront will will allow for for the there to be um, lease for other businesses that will then hire other people as well. So there'll be other there'll be other people renting the space. Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. About four bays. Okay. I mean, it's a beautiful building, and I'm thank you, thank you, Dale, for doing this. I think it's great, but you know, we just have a lot of people looking for the same, you know, same money, trying to invest in an area that you know we're going to run out of money soon. And you know, in terms of who can afford, all right. Anyways, thank you. You want to make a motion? Someone want to make a motion? Okay, it's been moved. Do I hear a second? Second. A resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the Fort Lauderdale Community Rate Development Agency waiving the minimum project cost requirement for reimbursement of eligible costs and the minimum contribution requirement under the Development Incentive Program for the project located at 200 to 250 West Sunrise Boulevard, approving an award of 727500 to Dales Wheels and Tires Direct, Inc., authorizing the Executive Director to execute any and all related instruments delegating authority to the Executive Director to take certain actions and providing for an effective date. Commissioner Moraitis? Yes. Commissioner Glassman? Yes. Commissioner McKenzie? Yes. Vice Chair Sorensen? Yes. Chair Trentales? Yes, and the resolution is approved. Any further business of the CRA? There being none, meetings adjourned. That's shade, right? There's two upstairs. You're welcome. Um, I now, I was uh, supposed to be given something to read, am I not? for a shade meeting yes all right everybody leave <laughs> i'm supposed to be given something to uh, read alan we're gonna have the shade meeting yeah i i that's not why it's the shade meeting so i don't i don't know yeah so so i believe there's a shade meeting to talk about the um, the uh, pickleball pickleball area but i don't understand do what we want to go on the eighth it's floor not, it's not your meeting let's go on the yeah eighth alan you need to be here for a shade meeting Sorry? you need to be here for a shade meeting Okay. Okay. It's, it's all right. It sounded so like you was asleep. I have to ask everyone to okay, leave great. the room except great. the uh, except the city manager, the, or in this case, the assistant city okay. manager. Do you, Do you think it makes sense for us to go to the eighth floor and have the shade meeting? No, let's just let's get it over with. Okay. Let's just do it here. Let's just. All do right. It. We got. We're gonna go upstairs. Everybody leaves. I know. Get out. <laughs>